Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome. 342 registrants supposed to be from 34 countries. On behalf of the organizers, the USDA FAS, Virginia Tech, ISA, and the Biotechnology Information Centers, we welcome animal biotechnologists in the academe and research institutions, policymakers, and regulations to the Asia Oceania Regional Animal Biotech Genetic Engineering and Genome Editing Virtual Workshop. I am Dr. Rodora Romero Aldemida, Director of the ISA Southeast Asia Center and the Global Knowledge Center on Crop Biotechnology. The aim of this workshop is to provide information on current innovations on animal biotechnology in four animal species, namely the poultry, aquaculture, swine, and cattle, and raise awareness on the benefits and opportunities in animal research, targeting animal welfare, and other public app, uh, applications in food and agriculture, provide information on how policymakers craft science-based policies in support for the utilization of animal biotechnology to enhance food security and agricultural sustainability, and how regulators conduct risk assessment for food, feed, and environment following relevant international standards. Similar events have been conducted in Africa and Latin America with other partners, including the ISA APRI Center and ICA. So these uh, two days will focus on specific presentations. So today is the first day and it will cover science and opportunities in four animal species and policy con considerations in biotech animals and policies in selected countries. Tomorrow, the second day, there will be a continuation of the policy considerations in selected countries. We will have food, feed, and environmental safety assessments and science communication on animal biotechnology. So the structure of the virtual workshops, the following, we will run for two days, three hours per day, conducted in the English language with no interpreter. So we are on FB, Facebook, and YouTube live stream. Resource speakers will present live following the agenda and times allocated. Queries should be entered in the Q&A function and will be read by the moderator, including the source of the query and to whom it is directed to. We will also recognize raised hands for queries and they will be allowed to unmute so that there can be interactive discussion. We also have a pre and post webinar evaluation surveys as we already have received yours, your pre survey. And so we will post tomorrow at the end of the workshop, the post webinar survey, and this will be the basis of your certificates. So we are giving away certificates for those who have completed the two days and at the same time have responded to the webinar surveys. So with that, let's proceed to the first session. The first session is on science and opportunities for biotech, genetic engineering and genome editing for animals, for food and agriculture. Our speaker is Dr. Carl Ramage. He is the managing editor of, uh, managing director of Rautaki Solutions, a consultancy business that supports the national and international biotech organizations across pub public and private sectors. He focuses on providing strategic and opera operational direction in biosafety and the commercialization of biotech products, including the development of regulatory strategy and the drafting of regulatory dossiers for submission and assessment by competent authorities. He has focused on building sustainable capability and capacity in biosafety and biorisk management. He's actively involved in the development and implementation of compliance management frameworks and compliance plans for physical containment facilities, as well as programs for the international release of genetically modified organisms into the environment. Let's welcome Dr. Carl Ramage, please. 
Thanks, Ola. I need a shorter bio, I think. Um, but thanks so much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really excited about the program and, and some of the speakers that we'll hear from um, uh, over the next two days. I guess my role uh, would being the first talk is to try to set a bit of a scene um, and, and hopefully stimulate some discussion as we go through uh, over, the, over the course of the next two days. I'll see if I can share my screen. Okay, um, I will assume, Mark, if you can nod, can you see my uh, my screen, Mark Tizard? Beautiful, thank you. Um, so as I said, uh, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about the science and potential of animal biotech uh, and some of the follow-up speakers are gonna go into a lot more detail uh, around some of the, um, um, with some examples uh, on some of those uh, animal species that, uh, that Ola mentioned. Um, but I think to start off with, we have to recognize the valuable contribution that animals have played particularly biotech animals in research and development over the last 50 years. Um, if you go to many of the uh, research institutions around the world, they often have uh, an animal facility uh, with model, model species that they use uh, to inform their research and, and teaching activities. Anywhere from uh, uh, model uh, mice, zebrafish, uh, rabbits. And, and as uh, time has gone on, we're starting to see uh, the introduction of uh, livestock species as, as model organisms as well. And the way that they have been um, created, uh, the genetic modification of animals has largely been done through two uh, pathways or two uh, uh, processes. One being an embryo mediated um, pathway where embryos are uh, somehow transformed with uh, a, 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 some sort of vector uh, to create the genetic modification, uh, or a cell-mediated pathway where um, from uh, an animal, embryonic stem cells or primary fibroblasts are developed, and they in turn are transformed through some process. Both of those uh, mediated uh, genetic modifications have some advantages and disadvantages, but nevertheless, these processes have underpinned the development of uh, biotech animals uh, for quite some time. And using those processes, we're, we're very lucky that there are a, a suite of um, uh, bi biomedical and particular models uh, in, in, in rodents, uh, as an example, uh, that can be used to study functional genomics of certain pathways for human uh, and animal diseases. But what's out there commercially? What can we eat? Uh, or what can we see? There's actually very few. So despite more than 25 years or around 25 years of uh, GM crop species, we really don't have much on the market from, from animals. Um, the most recent uh, um, launch, I guess, of, of a genetically modified or uh, a biotech animal uh, was the uh, Aqua Advantage salmon that, that uh, has been approved in, uh, in North America. Um, glowfish have been around for a little while um, and go through uh, waxes and wanes in terms of their popularity. Um, but there's been a lot of anti-activity around the use of animals uh, beyond research and development. And um, some may be familiar with the EnviroPig that was developed uh, in, in Europe many years ago, uh, very strong campaigns to uh, limit the commercialization or prevent the commercialization of that, uh, of that animal. Similarly, the Aqua Advantage salmon has taken many, many, many years to gain regulatory approval and finally uh, navigate the pathway to market for commercialization. So uh, animals have been used and are used extensively in R&D. Uh, and interestingly, the first nuclear transfer experiments uh, were undertaken in the early 1950s. So this is not a new technology. It's been around for quite some time. And in fact, Dolly the sheep was cloned using that somatic cell nuclear transfer process back in the late 90s, 1996. The animals that have been developed using uh, those te technologies have made significant contributions to our understanding of diseases, uh, behavior and development of biology. And they've led to the numerous uh, therapeutic treatments that have been developed and, and, and implemented. However, the process of creating a genetically modified animal is technically challenging. Uh, it's not always precise, uh, but the technologies have continued to improve uh, over the decades. Unfortunately, though, biotech animals 
are fairly limited in terms of what consumer products are available. And I guess what we'll hear about over the next couple of days are some opportunities and some of the challenges towards the pathway to market of those products. What is very interesting though, is genetic modification has been around for a long time, but many of you will be familiar with gene editing or genome editing as a new opportunity. And importantly, a new opportunity for uh, the creation or the use of livestock, tackling a number of livestock challenges. And we'll hear a lot of, about that over the next couple of days. But genome editing is essentially, in its most simplest term, uh, an enzyme that specifically targets a piece of DNA and makes a cut. It cuts that DNA in a very site-specific manner. And early uh, enzymes that were used to, uh, or identified to, to cut DNA, was sort of analogous to the invention of the telephone. And over time, a number of other forms of nucleases have been identified or modified and changed, and we've ultimately ended up with the mobile phone. Once uh, the DNA has been cut, there are essentially two pathways that are followed. Either the, the DNA is allowed to uh, heal, heal itself uh, through, uh, through its uh, natural process, uh, often referred to as site-directed nuclease one, or we provide a set of instructions and say, this is how we would like you to be repaired. Uh, and through homologous recombination or site-directed nuclease two process, we end up with a gene edit. This largely forms the foundations of genome editing uh, in both crops, plants, uh, and microbial systems. But similar to the uh, things that happen in technology, uh, those uh, processes continually being improved and, mod uh, and, and modified. So genome editing is no longer just cutting the DNA and allowing repair. We can also uh, use genome editing to target gene regulation. We can look at uh, just specific base changes. We can change the topography or the topology of chromatin and, and the way that um, uh, the DNA is, is, um, is condensed. So there's a whole suite of improvements in a toolkit now of, of processes for genome editing. And those processes still largely re uh, rely on traditional delivery methods. So those very two mediated uh, uh, transformation processes I talked about earlier. So for example, microinjection and electroporation from uh, uh, you know, into stem cells or in directly into embryos uh, are methods that are still being used. But there are also a whole suite of new uh, delivery methods that are that are becoming um, more and more favourable. So uh, the use of retroviral systems, the use of nanoparticles, and even these uh, uh, nano clues are also examples of how to get the genome editing machinery inside the cells to create those specific edits. Deciding what to edit though is a bit of a challenge too, but with the advent of improvements in genomics and genotyping and phenotyping, we can identify linkages between genes and phenotypes and then target those for improvements. But those decisions uh, have a number of challenges too. What do we edit? Why do we edit? And I, I guess we'll hear a little bit about that in some model species uh, in the subsequent talks. So genome editing is kind of like the mobile phone, but like all mobile phones, every year there's a new version. We're getting new targets, new methods and options for editing, new delivery systems, and even traits that are more complex that might require multiple edits are now starting to be published in, in the literature as viable options for, for commercialization. So genome editing offers targeted changes for specific outcomes. And that differs from genetic modification in the sense that we're not putting in whole genes or new genes. We're just targeting specific changes linked to a particular phenotypic outcome. Many editing options and delivery methods are, are available and many, many more are being developed uh, every week. The entire process brings together a whole lot of technically complex systems and methods. And that makes it challenging and sometimes expensive uh, not just to, only in identifying targets, but then delivering those targets and creating a product at the end of it. Um, many traits though are complex and will require multiple edits. So that is why what is driving and what is pulling through technological advances in genome editing. But under, underlying this though, decisions on what to edit can sometimes be morally and ethically challenging. And I guess we again, we'll hear a little bit more about uh, that as this, uh, the next two days um, proceed. So 
From a commercialization point of view though, genome editing as a technology is useless unless it complements existing breeding programs. So this is a very busy slide, but I guess it sits to represent that the future of in vitro breeding, for example, in livestock, looks at using elite male and female animals selected through genomics, uh, and then utilizing, for example, uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, creation of embryos, stem, establishing um, stem cultures, cloning, and, and a cycle, a, pr a production cycle to produce animals and products uh, from that, from that um, first selection. Genome editing does complement this in terms of opportunities to deliver those gene edits at the IVF step or through the embryonic stem cells and pushing that through to create products. But unless the technologies complement existing breeding programs, they're going to be very difficult to commercialize. Mm -hmm. And linked to that, that pathway to market requires a suitable value capture model. So one of the big challenges in livestock is saying, well, okay, I can edit a particular trait, but how do I make money out of it? And how do I recapture the value of the, the investment that I've put into creating those animals? And similarly, am I technology is it technology push? Am I pushing a particular trait to the market? Or am I recognizing what the market wants and I'm, I'm having those product, products pulled through? So again, in a, in a cattle example, uh, from across, we create some uh, a genome edit um, to, a, to an embryo, put that into a surrogate, leading to a bull. That bull produces semen to go into straws. And that is a product that we can sell. And if it's a desirable trait, then that product will be pulled through the market with a value capture. Similarly, if we take that surrogate, we produce a bull, and then we're able to mate that with a, another elite animal, perhaps we can create some, some crossbred animals that have a value. And that that value, again, is pulled by the market saying, we want that value, we want that trait. But this is a really uh, key step in the commercialization of any biotech crop. If you don't have product pool, if you don't have a value capture model, then you're never going to make it to market. Just want to provide a, a, an example of some proof of concept work that we're doing in Australia. Uh, and this is around genetic modification, gene editing of, for a, an animal welfare trait. Uh, and that is polled. So most of the dairy herd in Australia have horns. Uh, so the example here is, can we create an animal that doesn't require its horns chopped off? And the answer to that is, yes, we can using genome editing. So um, I might just see. Put on this. So hopefully you can see a little uh, red dot in the middle of that um, animal's head. Now I'm not going to shoot it, uh, but this animal here is called Burry, and, and this other animal in the back here is Spotty Guy. These two animals were genome edited uh, to not develop horns. So you can see they do not have horns. They never developed or grew horns uh, from, from day one. What we did is we took the semen from this ball and imported that into Australia. It was imported as a genetically modified organism because our legislation requires that. Um, and so they were kept and are kept in a, um, any animals would be kept in a, a certified containment facility. And we produced a small herd of genome edited progeny from, from this father. The genome editing technology used tailings uh, under an SDN2 pathway. So there was a guided repair to that edit. So the babies with no, born with no horns were allowed to grow up. Uh, interestingly though, you can see that linked to no, having no horns is that they have very nice long eyelashes. And maybe that's why I have long eyelashes because I don't have horns either. Interesting. I'm not sure about that though. What we've also done more recently is taken, uh, crossed one of those um, uh, daughters to, um, to, a, to a horned animal. And what we've got is two, um, two new babies. This one at the top uh, is polled or hornless. And this one at the front um, will, is a boy that will have horns. So this trait is segregating. So the question is, and again, hopefully we can uh, discuss that as we go through over the next couple of days, is are they or should they be regulated? Which ones should be regulated and why? So there are many, many GM and genome edit 
edited targets that have been identified and characterized for animals. And we're going to hear a lot more about that in the next um, in the next few talks. There are a lot of biomedical models that are being generated and used that, and now use genome editing techniques to facilitate an understanding and functional genomics of complex gene pathways for disease uh, and, and cancers, for example. We can buy ornamental fish and fish with high growth rates uh, commercially now. Uh, South America have also approved some, as well as North America. So they're currently on the market. We're starting to see the toad being dipped into the water. There are significant opportunities for improved animal welfare and health, particularly in livestock. So for example, no horns. But the commercialization of these products will really depend on a real clear pathway to market and an effective value capture model. So let's see how that will play out with some of the examples that we'll hear uh, in, in the next few talks. Thank you, Ola, and thank you everybody for listening. Thank you so much, Carl. Uh, to our audience, I'm very happy that we're now increasing in number. We are 122, and I hope that you have uh, already have an overview of what we're going to have in the next two days. So uh, Dr. Carl has provided us an overview and now we're going to go to the specifics of uh, biotechnology in animals. So uh, let's now, uh, thank you so much, Carl. Let's move on to our next speaker. So this is going to be a session two and this will be the state of research and development in animal species for food and agriculture. And we have invited four experts for different animal species. So the first one, so uh, our experts will provide information on poultry and then on livestock or cattle, aquaculture, and then on swine. So our first speaker would be uh, Tim Doran. He is a senior principal research scientist of CSIRO health and biosecurity. Welcome, let's welcome Tim Doran, please. Thanks, Ola. I'm just checking that you can hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, I'll share my screen. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ola, for the, uh, the opportunity to talk today, and thank you to the organisers of this wonderful workshop. Um, I work for Australia's um, government's research organisation, CSIRO, and I'm based at the Australian Centre for Disease Preparedness in Geelong, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about genome engineering in poultry, some of the opportunities that we see and some of the impacts, and a little bit about some of the work we do in this field. Um, first of all, why genetically engineer chickens or, or any other avian species for that matter. Um, there, are, there are four reasons that we can see that people are working in this field. One is, is biology. So um, chickens and quail in particular are very good model organisms for studying um, developmental biology. You, you know, can access the embryo quite easily uh, via um, the egg. So they're, they're used quite um, extensively in, in research. Um, the topic of today, of course, is agriculture. You know, they're obviously very important um, agricultural species, um, chickens in particular. So, you know, we're looking at, at work to generate chickens that are resilient to disease or have improved production traits, improve welfare and safer food products, improve sustainability. Um, biotechnology, there are some groups out there that are uh, developing genetically engineered chickens that lay eggs as uh, bioreactors for uh, high value proteins. So for example, pharmaceuticals. So in that sphere of bio farming. And, and finally, conservation. You know, there's the potential to use genome engineering technology to um, for genetic rescue opportunities in endangered bird species that need to be conserved or protected. But obviously today we're focusing around agriculture. So uh, a little bit about uh, how we apply genetic engineering technology or biotechnology approaches to, to chickens. Uh, we work with um, primordial germ cells or PGCs, and these are the stem cells that, that go on to form sperm or ova in um, mature adult chickens or birds. Um, quite uniquely in, in, in avian species, these PGCs in embryos migrate through 
the blood system, the vasculature on the path to the gonad where they become sperm or overproducing cells. And that means you can, you can access them from the embryo and work with them either outside of the embryo in culture. And this is work that was um, uh, developed by Marisa Sil van de Loire um, in the US. Uh, and, and is really quite a common way now of being able to produce uh, genetically engineered chickens where you can grow these germ cells in cultures in the lab, introduce genetic modifications into the cultured cells, expand them up and then reintroduce them into recipient embryos and generate modified uh, germline animals that way. Or there's a simpler method that uh, our lab developed and published in 2014, where we've showed that we can apply genome engineering tools directly to the embryo via what we call direct injection and modify the germ cells while they're still in the embryo. This is the method we use. Um, okay, I'm gonna focus on three opportunities that uh, we're working on and others. And these are examples that others uh, have, have recently published. Um, the first one is around disease resilience and avian influenza. So avian influenza is a, a, obviously a major problem in the poultry industry. It uh, has consistent and extensive outbreaks over the years, including recent years. Um, control methods like vaccinations are not fully effective. And of course, you know, in the current world of a pandemic that we're in right now, there's also significant threat of avian influenza viruses spilling from animals into humans to cause a flu pandemic as well. Um, so using uh, some really, you know, wonderful functional genomics and comparative genomic studies, there's a really good understanding of uh, the role that um, avian influenza virus polymerase protein uh, has in, in, in causing infection. And it's been observed that avian influenza virus polymerase does not function well in mammalian cells. And this is called host restriction. And when this was studied, it was identified that there's a, a difference in a particular gene called ANP32A um, that's present in, in chickens and also mammals. Um, and what happens in the avian gene, there's a, a segment that encodes for 33 amino acids that's inserted into the chicken uh, version of the AMP32A gene that's not in the human or mammalian version. And so uh, there's a wonderful publication from Long et al where they use CRISPR technology that, that Carl so um, wonderfully explained in his presentation to remove those 33 amino acids from the chicken AMP32A gene. They also knocked out the entire protein in chicken cells. And what they saw was it in the edited cells that expressed the short chicken version that supported mammalian uh, adapted, but not avian polymerase activity. And when you completely knocked out the AMP32A gene in those cells, it didn't support either mammalian or avian influenza polymerase activity and the cells were refractory to infection. So this is work that's now being led by the Rosal Institute. And we're very eagerly waiting to see the results of these experiments where they've generated um, genetically engineered edited chickens where they've modified the AMP32A gene. And we're hoping to see that there's some good levels of resilience to avian influenza in those birds. So that's one to keep an eye out on. The second example for disease resilience is uh, focused on avian leukosis virus, in particular, a subgroup uh, J. So this virus, ALVJ, causes significant economic losses in the poultry industry. Um, and the gene that they've been looking at is uh, the NHE1 gene, which is the receptor for the virus. And again, using comparative genomics and functional genomic studies, it was observed that a particular substitution of a single amino acid, this one here, tryptophan 38, in the NHE1 gene across a whole range of different um, avian species related to chicken. So we've got chicken and guinea fowl and quail and pheasant and turkey. If you had a single uh, substitution or deletion in this tryptophan 38 that confers resistance to infection. So it was a, a wonderful target, again, to, uh, to apply genome editing technologies to, to see whether or not you could edit this gene in the chicken that's susceptible to the virus to delete this tryptophan. And the results of that uh, experiment were published as well. And the chickens that had the edit of this tryptophan were shown to be highly resilient to ALVJ. And so, again, a wonderful use of, of genome engineering technology to confer resistance to diseases. And we're hoping that one of the, the major breeding companies will be taking this one forward at some stage. 
Um, the next example that I wanted to, to, to briefly mention was around increased food safety, and in particular, uh, egg allergy. So egg allergy is, uh, is very widespread. It impacts more than 40 million children worldwide. Uh, in the US alone, the, the cost of childhood food allergies is estimated to be about 25 billion per year. So it's a very big problem. It seems to be a growing problem as well with, with the incidence of egg allergy uh, increasing and the time it takes for children to outgrow egg allergy also increasing as well. So it's a major food safety issue um, for, uh, for companies and, and, and industries that use eggs. It also has implications for the, the vaccine industry because there are quite a few vaccinations that are um, manufactured in chicken eggs, like the influenza vaccine uh, in particular. So egg allergy is caused by four proteins that are present within the egg white. And one of these uh, proteins in particular, ovomucoid or OVM, is the most predominant allergen within egg white. Um, it makes up a small amount of total egg white protein. It's also the one that's resistant to cooking and digestion as well. And so uh, a group fairly recently in Japan published the use of um, genome engineering technology, so CRISPR technology to uh, remove the ovomucoid gene in a hen to show that you could get a reproductively viable hen that lays an egg without that um, protein being present. It was a wonderful study. And so this is something we're pursuing within our lab and within CSIRO. And that is how we can uh, take that observation and take it forward to generate an OVM gene knockout hen that lays an egg that is much safer to be used in cooked egg products. So that's remembering again that the OVM is the one that's resistant to cooking and digestion. So if you remove that egg white protein, the other three that can cause allergy get denatured by cooking and heating. So we feel that there's an opportunity here to take forward uh, an egg product or products that are much safer for those that um, unfortunately suffer um, allergic reactions to egg products. And we're hoping that we may be able to achieve something truly novel and disruptive in the whole free from food industry here in Australia with that opportunity. Um, the final example that I wanted to mention is, is the work of my colleague, Mark Tizard, who's, who's listening in today and, and I think will be involved later on in the workshop. And that's uh, a technology to be able to uh, use sex selection to prevent the, the issue of, of culling male chicks in the, uh, the global egg laying industry. So the, the challenge for this uh, scientific goal is to develop a technology to detect and remove male embryos prior to hatch. So that when, the leg, when the egg is laid, without having to open up the shell and, and take samples. It needs to be uh, high throughput, very accurate and, and low cost. And um, you know, there's, there's definitely a global industry demand for a solution to the problem of male chick culling. And in some countries now, um, particularly in, in Europe, they're very close to, um, to uh, introducing um, laws to ban the culling of male chicks. So it's a very, very much a growing concern to the global industry. So our approach is to uh, integ integrate a trans gene that expresses a fluorescent marker gene onto the sex chromosome of um, the female breeder hen. So in chickens, sex chromosomes are opposite to, to mammals. Uh, it's the hen, the female that is heterogamatic. So it has a, she has a Z and a W chromosome and the males are homogamatic. So they have two Z chromosomes. So if you put a marker on the, the Z sex chromosome of the female breeder, only male embryos or male chicks will inherit that marker. And so we are able to um, then identify through the shell the, um, the presence of that marker gene at point of lay. Uh, there's no culling then of day old male chicks. We don't have to incubate them and take them through the hatch. Um, and of course, the females that result from that breeding don't inherit that marked chromosome at all. They, they inherit their uh, Z chromosome from the male, which is not modified in any way. So all of these hens are not GM. So here's just a little bit of an example of uh, how, we, how we use this technology using direct injection. So we um, directly in, introduce into a, an embryo at day 2.5 of age, the genetic engineering tools. You know, so this, this, this could be CRISPR-Cas9, uh, it could be talons, it could be transposons that can introduce the marker gene. We seal up the egg, we incubate, we take that through to hatch, we raise the, the, the males to sexual maturity, we take a semen sample, 
from the male um, and we identify the, the male that is most chimeric for the presence of the transgene in the sperm cells. We then put that male into a mating, generate chicks, screen them for the presence of the, of the transgene. And in this case, we're looking for a female that has the, the marker gene on the said chromosome. And then when we put that female into a mating, we can identify male embryos by the presence of the fluorescent marker in the, um, the blastoderm at, point, uh, at, at the point of lay, so um, before they're, they're incubated. And of, of course, you can't see any marker gene in the female embryo that's developing at that stage because it's not present and not GM. So um, a little bit uh, of a look at the um, supply chain and how this works. So for this technology, we need to be working with the global genetic companies. They um, are the ones that, that, uh, that have the issue of having to cull the male chicks. So they'll be able to screen uh, at point of lay for the, the females. The females then go off to local farmers. Um, the hens are exactly the same as they are today. They don't inherit the marked um, chromosome through the breeding process. The eggs that those hen lays, uh, you know, head off to the, the shelves on the supermarkets um, and they're the same as they are today. Um, and, you know, so the supply chain goes through the local farmers, the local supermarkets, the local consumers, and they're not GM in any way. Um, the marked males are removed. And of course, there's no more culling of the day old male chicks, so that problem solved. But what we're also doing in our lab is looking at how we can um, add value to those removed marked male eggs. And we have a technology called Platform Z that we're developing where we're trying to improve these eggs for a range of different biotechnology applications. But the main one is in vaccine production. So as I mentioned, um, flu vaccine production uses a lot of fertilized chicken eggs. So we can see that we can convert what's essentially a, a low value um, product at the moment, or even a waste stream in some, uh, some countries into a high value purpose for being able to produce better vaccinations and, and better vaccines in these um, male marked eggs. Um, I think I'm just about right on time. So just finally, just like to thank the team in CSIRO that works on all of these opportunities. Uh, and also just highlight Mark, who's been a major driver behind the sex selection technology that we've been developing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Team Doran. So you have seen uh, what's going on in poultry and these are the research being done in Australia at CSIRO. Uh, we would like to invite everyone who would like to raise questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A box. I know that there is a lot of interest in poultry in our audience. We have a lot of um, uh, researchers uh, in our audience right now. So uh, I invite you to please put your questions. We can now proceed. Uh, we are uh, on time, so uh, I'm really excited for the our Q&A. Uh, and I hope that we can have questions when we get there. So our next speaker would be talking about livestock or cattle. Uh, he is Dr. Lercio Porto Neto. He leads the animal genomics team at CSIRO, agriculture and food. Uh, with projects across livestock and agriculture species and a growing interest in gene editing technologies. He graduated from the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine of the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil, then moved to Australia to pursue his PhD in molecular genetics at the University of Queensland. Let's welcome Dr. Lercio Portoneto. Thank you very much for the invite and congratulations for the presentation so far. It's a hard task to, to follow the two presenters there. They were, did a great job. Oh, let me start sharing here. Presentation. Centre mode. There is everything right. Let me see if I can find the laser point. Yeah, it's good. Points, laser point. Okay. I'm also a research scientist at CSRO in Australia. And uh, what I'm talking today will be some developments in, in the cattle world. And uh, will be, there'll be some overlaps in the presentations from Cal, uh, but we go slowly to, to add more content and explain a bit more details of the, the, the tasks that we see. I'm gonna go 
quick outline. So we'll talk a little bit about the delivery system to industry, which uh, Carl mentioned about how, how we capture value and, and create impact. So we need a delivery system to industry. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. And then I'm gonna go a little bit about the methodologies that have been applied in cattle, some considerations for the trade selection, and finally some examples that are, that are going. So when we, when we think about how we create impact on gene editing, we need to combine with the, reprodu the reproduction biotechnologies. The, the gene editing per se, we won't be able to, to deliver impact in industry if we don't combine with the reproduction technology. And even to develop animals if in genetic animals, or we need to go through a good understanding of reproduction technology. So I, I combine these two of my passions. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good start. So when I talk about reproductive biotechnology, I'm talking about artificial insemination or fixed time artificial insemination on in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer on cloning. In the advanced genomics on the other side, I have like genomic estimated breeding values or embryo genotyping or gene editing or pluripotent cell transfer, for instance. I would say that the reproduction side, they are well-established, they are good, well-established technologies and used to multiply desired animals. And in the, the genomic side, there are mixed development stages. Some are really ready to go and really being commercially applied, but some still need some refinement. And how do we combine those two in the context of gene editing? Let's get there. I, I created this as a, some, it's very academic separation like this, because it's, it's not a so clear cut between different properties, but we can think about some low technology areas, some medium technology areas, and some high technology areas. And the combination of reproduction and, and genomics, we can think about in the low technology like this. You use a genomic breeding value to select bulls and use bulls. Or you use a genomic breeding value to select bulls that you will use to produce semen, and then you do artificial insemination. So there will be the very low tech using that bit of technology for the entry stage. The second stage, a little, adding a little bit more complexity, we can use a genomic breeding value to select a bull, but then you use one is the fixed time artificial insemination. So you use a hormonal protocol to synchronize your female cow, your cows, to use artificial insemination. Or you can do one step further. So you use in vitro fertilization. So you select the bulls, select your cows, use a genomic breeding value, and then you use an in vitro fertilization in this, this in the medium technology. And in the high technology side, we can use the gene editing plus cloning or the in vitro fertilization plus gene editing. I would say that those, the low tech to medium tech, you have, I would say they have a high penetration. And the high technology, you have low penetration, mainly because in the high technology, you can only generate few animals. But in the, in the low to medium technology, you can generate lots of animals. So we can target herd improvement in the low technology and medium technology, but in the high technology, we would generate great animals. So the technology, I would say, for the low tech and medium, they are ready to use, or in some case, they are near to use. Again, depending on the situation, the country, and, and, the, and the breed that you want to work on, but uh, they are pretty much ready to use. The high technology, they mostly under development either by technical aspects or even for the regulatory aspects. But the idea that uh, how we can gain value and create impact using the high technology. The, the key idea is that uh, from animals generated using this high technology, we would feed to low to medium technology to generate impact in the industry and uh, herd improvement and uh, high penetration. With that concept, in place. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the how the we have been applying the gene editing technologies in, in livestock. We with similar plots were presented before, but uh, I'll, I'll highlight here again. So we 
one of, one of the key approaches and then one of the first ones that were used is using cloning. So cell cloning, so you do, you start with a cow or a bull or a fetus, you isolate cells from this animal and then you do your gene editing in a Petri dish and then you can screen the cells and select very precisely the mutations that you want that you put so you very precisely know what is there and then you use those cells in a cloning procedure and the cloning procedure you you get an empty egg you add your cell that you want and then you form an embryo put in a surrogate cow and get the, the your gene edit animal offspring with the precision that you, you want this gene this procedure is very good in the sense that you have a full control on the genetic modification. But there is one very strong drawback, which is the low efficiency in generating those offsprings. The, and this is mainly due to the cloning step. The cloning step is far from ideal in a, in a, as a reproductive technology, biotechnology. It's a very, very low efficiency. So sometimes you're going to Oh, often you're going to have to generate many, many embryos, many, many pregnancies to generate very few offsprings. So trying to, to avoid the cloning step, other two, two methods were proposed. One, which is the microinjection in the embryo or the electroporation in the embryo as well. So you start, instead of starting cells in a petri dish, you start with an embryo. You use and this embryo, you either do a microinjection or you do uh, electroporation. And these embryos are much more viable than the clones so that you can put in a surrogate cows, transfer to surrogate cows and generate quite, quite often, you can generate lots of offsprings. But the catch here, you don't have a lot of control on your, on your gene editing procedure. So you might end up with lots of offsprings but there will be some wild types, there'll be some fully transformed, fully trans uh, gene edited, the two copies of the gene, some will be partially edited like a heterozygote or a mosaic animal. So it's a, it's a much more efficient in the sense that you're gonna generate a lot of animal, lot of animals, but not a highly efficient in the sense that you're gonna have a variety of genotypes in the end. So then trying to avoid this problem that generates a lot of animals without the genotype that you want, it was proposed another step. So with the step when you do your microinjection in the embryo or your electroporation, and then around day six or seven in your blastocyst, you can get a biopsy of it. And then you freeze, you vitrify the embryo, and then you do the DNA analysis. And then you screen for the, all the embryos that you produce to, the, to define which embryos you want to transfer to a surrogate cow. And then you transfer only the ones that carry the mutation that you want. So, and then you be able to generate of co better control on the offspring that you're going to generate. So the vitrified embryo is, is not as good in the sense that generating pregnancies than the fresh embryo but it's still, it's still much better than generating many, many other animals that you won't be used. So now, so we explained to the, the, the methodologies that we use, and now we're gonna talk a little bit, the other point that Carl touched as well, and then we can come back more in the, in the Q and A, is about the trait selection and finally some examples. So the trait selection that Carl was saying that is it a, a technology push that we know that it will be interesting? Are we scientists think that it will be a, a very relevant point or is a really industry need? So I create here this decision tree that I call, but uh, to, for trade selection. And uh, we can discuss a lot. There will be lots, many workshops about this trade selection. So I just put some here to, to start the discussion. And I start here with, proposing that we should start at, as an industry problem. So what is the industry problem that we're trying to solve using gene editing or, or, or similar approaches? Is it a, a welfare issue, a health issue, 
environmental or, or simply productivity. So these points will, will help drive the trade selection. The other one is a key one is, is there a gene or a gene variant already identified? So we, we, there is, the, the technology is advancing a lot, so we can, we can quite often identify good targets. But for the gene editing, we really need a specific, a very specific change that needs to be done. And quite often you, you, you find, we have the KTLs or you really know the gene, but uh, we don't know the specific variants. So that will, that will mean that we'll need a bit more work before, before getting to the, to the application of gene editing. And then the other one is how complex is the gene editing? Is it a simply knockout will do the job? Or is it a single base change that we need to put? Uh, all of these, the, the level of complexity of gene editing will, impl will, will impact the, your ability to generate animals and, uh, and potentially the, the regulatory process. And the regulatory process goes again with the next one, which is, is it a GM solution? So it's, it, it, it can, can create a lot of burden in the regulatory process if it's a GM solution. Uh, another one that the that, that team just mentioned before about how to deal with the parents, uh, if the parent is, is a GM, but the offspring is not. So it's a, this, there is a lot of a process thinking and how to, to manage this in, in a regulatory perspective as well. And the other one that I like is, can we scale it up? Can we scale up the production of the animal? And this goes together with the complexity. If it's a highly complex gene edit that we need, we might not be able to scale up. So we might not be able to do a, a huge impact in the industry that we would like to. So if this consideration the trait, I'm just gonna go through a few examples that I highlight from, from the, improving the complexity of the of the of the edit. So we start with the coat color. The coat color, the these two genes that are known, the MC1R and the PML gene. So they are known to change the coat color. So this is the Angus boo. So you you if you have the big E allele or the small E allele, so small E allele is the recessive, the red. So if you do a change in this base pair, so you can you can change the color, the coat color of the animal. And similarly, in the, the change in the spinal gene, which is that is a deletion there, if you introduce the deletion, you go from, from black, the white type, to white. So these are, the, the, the female mutation is, is slightly simpler than the other one because it's not a, a single base change. So the single base change is a little bit more complex to, to put a specific chain than this is small deletion, unless you want a precise specific deletion that can add complexity to that as well. It's still in the code, we have the code type. The code type, they have this prolactin receptor gene. We have now the several mutations being described. The first one was described with the, is the Senepol cattle carrier, which is called the slick mutation. And here we have this, this picture is, is a producer in Australia that use Senepol cattle. So there you can see a carrier of the, of the slick gene when you, and the, with a very slick coat and then the hairy one here, the non-carrier of the slick gene. So those, the coat color and the coat type they being related to the thermal resistance of the animal, thermal, or how heat stress the animal, how heat stress or heat susceptible the animal is. So there are groups in US and groups in New Zealand that are trying to combine either those two mutations, the red, the black, and the slick coat, and the, or the white and black with the slick coat, trying to make taurine cattle more adapted to the tropics. So these are the currently uh, the animals are being born, I think, and then uh, there are a few reports on the on the publications. Um, so there will be interesting to see in uh, this experimental design when you and you combine and edit those animals if they will be really more thermotolerant or heat or heat tolerant than the than their counterparts. Other two examples that I want to put. So so here on the on on the left. 
is the heavy muscle, is, is about the productivity, carcass yield. When, uh, again, many, many mutations described in the myostatin gene and uh, some are very, uh, carry a very strong phenotype with the very double muscling, which is called the double muscling. So it's a very muscular animal and some a little bit more mild than that, than that as well, but all of them relate to carcass yield. So if you have some variants, uh, some variants in the in the myostatin gene, you can have like this. So the, so these are the, the same age animals on the right. You have a heavy muscle variant gene with the and and in the left side is um is smaller carcass yield than the, the right one. So there's several mutations there, and then and this is a target gene is a full proof of principle in, in, in many, many different species that have been used. And in cattle, they do have an, uh, uh, an application for carcass yield. And the one on the right is one that was mentioned before. So which is, if like, if I'm not wrong, like Carl says, I think we are in the third generation of these young bulls here. So the one of them generates semen, semen went to Australia, so to generate animals, the offspring had another offspring. So they are, they are already in the third generation of the gene edit for Paul, gene edit for Paul. So again, this is a complex mutation that was introduced in the chromosome one, which is not a specific gene. It's just a one, one, one fraction of the chromosome that needs to be changed. So they change and generate the Paul animal there. There is a lot of research trying to figure out exactly how is the biological mechanism around the pole, which is not that clear yet. And the final two examples I want to do, which I want to show is one is creating sex bias, which is, I think, like similar to the, to the poultry industry in cattle would also be very relevant for animal production. So that if we could bias the sex of the animal. And here we, um, I'm putting the, the approach, it is a transgenic approach. So the, the, this group in, in UC Davis, California, they introduced the SRY gene in the chromosome, chromosome 17 of this bull with the hope that 75% uh, of the offsprings of this bull will, will generate uh, male calves. I think Alison was there. I checked a little while ago. Alison was in the call, so maybe in the Q&A, she can give us a little bit of an update of what it was, what is the about of this, of this little calf of, because uh, I don't know what happened after, the, after this publication yet. So, and the final one that I want to talk about is another one that I, I really liked the idea and the concept, which is the surrogate males. I put the, the drawing here of the, of the mice, but uh, it was done in cattle as well. So the idea is that you generate some males, fully developed males, but they, they don't have spermatogonial stem cells. So they don't produce sperm. So they, they have a fully functional testis, but they don't have spermatogonial stem cells. So and the idea is that you recolonize the testis with the spermatogonial stem cells, so they will produce sperm of the animal that was used to recolonize the testes. So in here in, in the graph is like this. So the white and the white mouse here, the white male is a fully developed one, but they don't produce sperm because they, they lack spermatogonous cells. So, but they can, we can harvest the, the spermatogonous stem cells from the black one here, the culture expand them and then transfer to recolonize the testes of the white one. After, after a little bit of time, these, these mice will start then producing semen or producing sperm, but not from them, not from the white one, it's from the donor. And then you, you can see here the offsprings when you have the, the mating here, the, 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 the pair, the adult pair with the, the white ones with the black offsprings, which are the offsprings of the of the, the male side is, the, is this, comes from the donor cell. So this is a complex, is a complex process, but again, there is a direct application in the, uh, potentially a direct application in the cattle industry. And similar to the, to the 
So the issues with Tim and Mark with the with the parents that are transgenic and uh, or and the offspring that is not. So here, if it's just a simple knockout in the nanos, potentially it's not even the, the transgenic, but it is a very complex biotechnology, reproductive biotechnology that uh, will be interesting to see how the regulatory process will pan around, uh, will, will, will regulate around this. With this, uh, with those short complex examples, I'll, I'll stop here and then uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lerisho. We would like to uh, highlight the fact that uh, even in cattle, uh, it's not only the animal welfare, but also for people's welfare, for the consumers, that genome editing and genetic engineering is being done. I mean, the traits that are chosen for the livestock are also not not only for the animal welfare, but also for, for the consumers. So we'd like to uh, ask again our uh, audience to please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I know that some of our panelists have been answering the, the questions, but we will also take those up because our audience do not see the, the questions and the answers altogether. So let's proceed to our next speaker. Uh, this will be no, no, now a focused on aquaculture. And so we will have a Dr. Eric Hallerman. He's a professor in the Department of Fish and Wildlife Conservation at Virginia Tech University in the United States. He has been involved in aquaculture biotechnology for almost 35 years and uh, first producing genetically modified fish later contributing to biotechnology risk assessment and public policy. He has served on advisory panels for the US Department of Agriculture, National Research Council, and several companies. He has helped to organize several international workshops on animal biotechnology and related oversight issues. Let's welcome Dr. Eric Hallerman, please. All right, thank you, Ola. Um, Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whatever greeting is appropriate for your time zone. Well, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you about genome editing and aquaculture. Um, let me start by setting the context for my talk. Um, aquaculture is important to human nutrition and to regional economies. Um, aquaculture's contribution to the world supply of fisheries products has grown from 4% when I was a young man to over half of our production of fisheries products today. Um, and globally, uh, uh, aquaculture products are important to human nutrition, especially in developing countries and especially in Asia. Uh, globally, aquaculture employs over 20 million people, 85% of them in Asia. Well, to also to put this into a context for our workshop, I'll make the case that fishes are excellent systems for genome editing. First of all, fishes have high fecundity um, from hundreds to many thousands of eggs per ovulation. Uh, protocols for artificial induction of spawning ex exist for many species, especially cultured species. Uh, fertilization is external and it's easily conducted in vitro. Um, the eggs are relatively large and they're very amenable to micro injection. Uh, embryonic and larval development occur outside the mother. Uh, egg incubation and larval rearing methods are well established for cultured species. Um, and generation times range from one to several years, depending on your species. And at least in the case for the ones that mature within one year, you can make relatively rapid progress. Well, the first genome editing experiments in fishes use model systems such as zebrafish, first using zinc finger nucleases, then followed by talent and ultimately by CRISPR-Cas9. The majority of experiments anymore are done with the CRISPR-Cas9 system. Um, then these protocols had to be adapted to aquaculture species. The first experiments especially often use marker genes to show that transformation had occurred. In one well-cited study, Edwardson et al. Uh, selected selected the solute carrier family 45, member two, and tyrosinase genes that are known to be involved in pigmentation of fishes as marker genes. Um, 
40 and 22% of the injected Atlantic salmon embryos showed mutations at their respective genes. And these mutations displayed a range of phenotypes ranging from complete lack of pigmentation that I'm showing at the top of each of those panels on the right, to partial loss to normal pigmentation. Uh, another important outcome of these early experiments is that CRISPR-Cas9 can induce double allelic knockout in the founder generation, but those doing the experiments have to be aware of the possibility of mosaicism in these founders, which will affect inheritance in the following generation. Okay, after these early experiments, many cultured species have been genome edited for value traits. Uh, this is a fairly busy table, so let me walk you through it. In the first column on the left, I show a ranking of the first, say, 15 species of their production in world aquaculture. And then at the bottom of the table, I'm showing the remaining species that have been subject to genome modification experiments. Uh, two points that I want you to get from this table. Um, many important species have not yet been subject to genome editing experiments. The other important point that I want you to get is what are the traits that have been attempted to be altered in favorable ways by these experiments. These include growth and muscle development, reproductive confinement, disease resistance, and there's some other traits too. Now, clearly I can't talk about all of these studies in a talk of 15 minutes scope. So what I'll do is talk about selected case studies in the context of the particular traits that were the subject of these experiments. All right, so enhancement of growth and of muscle development are common breeding goals in aquaculture breeding programs. Uh, myostatin, which I'm showing at the upper right, is a key regulator of skeletal muscle growth in all vertebrates. Downregulated expression of myostatin is linked with the double muscle phenotype that Laercio was talking about in the previous talk. Um, that is the case not only in cattle, but in other animals that result in increased muscling relative to breeds that lack the causal mutation. Myostatin knockout in mice also led to that double muscling phenotype. And since then, that approach has been applied to a variety of aquacultured species, including common carp, channel catfish, olive flounder, red sea bream, yellow catfish, and Nile tilapia. Let's focus on yellow catfish. Yellow catfish is an important aqua species, aquaculture species in China, but it has small ultimate size and low fillet yield, which limit its value in the marketplace. Could knockout of the myostatin gene help address these issues in production of yellow catfish? Well, to answer this, Dong et al. disrupted the myostatin A gene using zinc finger nucleases. And what they found is that homozygous mutants display the double muscling phenotype with two obvious muscle masses between the head and the dorsal fin starting at one month of age and that trait became more apparent with growth. Uh, look at the second picture there with KO and you can see those humps are much larger than in the wild type that I show at the top. Further and perhaps of greater interest is that the weight of the myostatin A knockout fish was about 30% higher than their wild type siblings at 80 and 210 days post-fertilization. Now, the results of histological analysis showed that what had occurred is that the myostatin A knockout fish had increased numbers of muscle fibers with decreased fiber size. In a follow-up study, Zhang et al. in the same group showed that the genome-edited myostatin A fish grew and bred normally. Okay, reproductive confinement is a serious issue in aquaculture. Uh, that's because cultured fishes also escape, often escape from aquaculture facilities where they pose ecological impacts upon receiving ecosystems, especially if they're a non-native species, and they pose genetic impacts upon locally adapted populations with which they might interbreed. Hence, reproductive confinement is really important from an environmental standpoint. Reproductive confinement also protects the interest of the breeder and their investment in the genetic improvement program. And several lines of research have been opened into the reproductive confinement of several key aquaculture species, 
including Nile tilapia, channel catfish, and Atlantic salmon. I'm gonna focus on the Atlantic salmon example. Um, in work done in Norway, Anna Wargelius and her group sought to produce germ, germ cell-free Atlantic salmon by knocking out DND, dead end, which encodes a factor that's required for the survival of germ cells. And indeed, the induced DND mutations produced fish that lacked germ cells. Following up on this, Kleppa et al. So the germ cell free salmon remained immature and did not undergo puberty. So what I'm showing here in the middle is a panel of four pictures comparing gonadal development in different types of Atlantic salmon. First of all, on the left, a wild type female, if you look at the inset picture, you can see the yellow masses. Well, that's a fully developed ovary in that age of Atlantic salmon. The second picture has a DNA knockout female that has undeveloped ovaries. The third picture shows a wild type male, and you can see the white masses there. Those are the uh, testes in the fertile male. The last picture is a DND knockout male, which if you look closely, has clear stringy testes that contain no sperm. Now, well and good, that's a favorable result, but there's a problem that faces practical salmon production. Salmon lacking germ cells can't be used for breeding. Hence, you need a strategy for recovering the reproductive ability for these fish in aquaculture. So Garalp et al. from the same group reported a rescue approach for producing germ cells in DND knockout animals. What they did is they co-injected the wild type variant of DND messenger RNA together with a CRISPR CRISPR-Cas9 construct targeting DND into the oocytes of females. What they showed is that rescued one-year-old fish did contain germ cells. Actually, in the males, you had type A spermatogonia, and you had pre-vitelogenic primary oocytes in the females. What this shows is that fish to be used as broodstock could be re rescued, while production fish, which would be intended for culture in open net pens in the sea would not be subject to this additional step. So the demonstration of rescue opens the possibility for large scale production of germ cell free Atlantic salmon offspring. Disease resistance is a trait of major interest for growers. That's because aquaculture stocks are commonly held at really high population densities and the fish are subject to physiological and social stress, and that renders them especially susceptible to parasites and pathogens. Hence, loss to disease is a major threat to aquaculture enterprises. Genetic improvement of disease resistance is a high, breed, is a high breeding priority. So several genome editing experiments have addressed improvement of disease resistance in certain key species, including rohu, which is an Indian major carp, grass carp, which is a Chinese major carp, and channel catfish, which is widely produced in North America. Let's focus on the case study of grass carp. A major disease of grass carp is hemorrhagic disease, and it's caused by grass carp real virus. And what makes this particularly difficult is this virus has, major, has many genotypes, and that leads to huge economic losses. What I'm showing at the upper right are grass carp that are suffering from two different uh, genotypes of that virus. Um, and I also show the third picture of that is an animal which is not so affected. Uh, what I want you to pick out on that are the subcutaneous hemorrhaging in the two specimens that have the real virus disease. Well, it seems that junction adhesion molecule A or JAMA A which is a member of the immunoglobulin superfamily, is implicated in the entry of the virus into host cells. Hence, knockout of that gene may be useful for developing therapies against grass carp virus infection. So with that as a background, Ma et al. knocked out the grass carp JAMA gene and evaluated in vitro resistance against various GCRV genotypes. 
Now, CRISPR-Cas9 effectively knocked out JAMA and reduced infection for two different grass carp rheovirus genotypes as was measured in kidney cell cultures. What I'm showing at the lower right is virus titer at 24 and 72 hours for two different viral types. Viral titer for the knockout lines that's shown in black was less than that in wild type cells, which is shown in gray. So overall, what this experiment showed is that JAMA A is necessary for GCRV infection, and the results suggested that knockout might be a viable approach for control of the disease. This work will have to be studied also in vivo in order to show positive proof of principle. Now, genome editing might be applied to understand genes that affect value traits and ultimately to approach other breeding goals. So just briefly, in one experiment, Pacific bluefin tuna were subject to uh, an experiment uh, to knock out a particular gene that has to do with muscle contraction properties. And the point here is to minimize injuries to the tuna from bumping into the walls of the net pens in which they're being cultured. Coloration is an important trait for the marketplace. Animals that have attractive coloration get a slightly higher price in the market. Hence, modifying the fish to get valued phenotypes uh, is an important line of, uh, of uh, research. And that's been pursued in large-scale loach, which is marketed in Eastern Asia, um, white crucian carp, which is marketed especially in China, and Atlantic salmon marketed worldwide. Another interesting line of research has to do with uh, conferring hydrated fatty acid or altered fatty acid composition of the flesh to Atlantic salmon. What we're looking to do is to increase the concentration of omega-3 fatty acids in the uh, Atlantic salmon fillets, which offers a potential benefit to the consumer. Now, the scope of world aquaculture includes not only fishes, but also moss, crustaceans, and seaweeds. And some recent work has developed protocols for genome editing in these taxa. These lines of research are more preliminary and have not progressed as far as the lines of research that I just described for the fishes. Mollusks are particularly difficult to work with because their eggs are very small and they develop very quickly. Uh, you et al. developed a CRISPR-Cas9 uh, protocol for introducing ribonucleoproteins into Pacific oyster eggs. Crustaceans are also difficult to transform, much like poultry. Fertilization is internal and the eggs by the time they're extruded are already well along in development. Nonetheless, GUI et al. applied CRISPR-Cas9 technology that targeted the chitinase gene of ridgetail white prawn and showed modification. Now, seaweeds are the largest sector of world aquaculture and I found no reports of genome editing of seaweeds. Mm. Um, so I've made the case that genome editing provides powerful tools for the genetic improvement of aquaculture stocks. Well, what will it take to achieve practical adoption of genome edited fishes in normal production? Well, industry must see a pathway to commercialization with risk scaled enabling regulatory policy. These policies are yet to be developed in many countries, and that will be the subject of talks uh, later on today and tomorrow. Um, we also would expect, especially in the aquaculture sector, to be restricted to the use of well-confined culture systems, like the recirculating aquaculture system that I'm showing on this slide. Now, we'll also need effective communication um, to promote consumer acceptance, focusing on key messages like this is health food, uh, it's produced sustainably, and it's produced near the market. There's one line, though, that I want to mention before we go any further, because this may be the first line of genome edited animals that reaches the marketplace. The genome edited Nile tilapia FLT01 line has been developed by Aquabounty, has a homozygous deletion that leads to an early stop codon in the myostatin gene. The loss of function of myostatin increases muscle mass 
fish weight and fillet yield. Now the line was produced using nuclease messenger RNA. There was no introduction of DNA, so that, and there are no off-target ta sites of modification. The fish is potentially ready for production because there's no new genetic material or unwanted integration of plasma DNA. The product is not covered under the scope of a regulated article under the Cartagena Protocol. Under Argentine uh, policy, under their new breeding technologies uh, policy, this fish is not a GMO. And Brazil made a similar determination two years ago. So this may be the first genome edited animal to reach the marketplace. So what are the take home messages I'd want you to retain from this quick overview of the aquaculture center? Well, aquaculture is important to human nutrition, especially in Asia. Fishes are amenable to genome editing, which has been applied to improve a range of traits, including growth of muscle, control of reproduction, resistance to disease and other traits. And genome edited fish, this one leading line, the FLTO one Nile tilapia, can be produced in commercial aquaculture once we achieve some preconditions, risk and risk scaled enabling regulatory policy, use of well-confined culture systems, and measures to promote consumer acceptance. And that's my view of genome editing and aquaculture. Ola, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you so much, Eric. It's amazing how much uh, genome editing has been done to aquaculture, not only in fishes, but also in seashells, mollusks, crustaceans. And I know that we have a lot of questions coming up. So please post your questions. And we're now, thank you so much again, Eri. So we can now proceed to the Q&A. And uh, let's uh, go back to the first questions on uh, which Dr. Carl Ramage was responding to, the comparison between conventional genetic modification and genome editing, please. Yeah, thanks, Ola. It's a really, really interesting question and one that really um, I guess um, is not consistent and, and that creates some challenges for the introduction and commercialization of some of these products. So, um, you know, many of the regulatory systems around the world have different definitions on what is a GM or a gene edited product. Um, uh, some of those systems and many of them actually um, consider the process of gene technology as a trigger for regulation and therefore uh, genome editing and genetic modification may be seen as one and the same thing and regulated the same. In other jurisdictions, they might look at the, the definition in a slightly different way. So in South America, for example, it was mentioned, I think, in, um, in Eric's talk about the Cartagena protocol has a definition of what a genetically modified organism is or a, or a living modified organism. And that really centers around the introduction of, of new DNA. Um, so if there's no new introduction of, uh, of DNA, then it may not be considered a genetic modified organism. And that's, all, I think, why the, the tilapia uh, may bypass uh, uh, the need to go through regulation in, in, in parts of South America. Other um, uh, economies might look at their regulatory system from the point of view of the product rather than the process. Um, so in the US, again, uh, looking at their product and saying, well, is, has anything changed substantially compared mm -hmm. to what could be developed using conventional breeding. And if there's nothing substantially different, then it may not be considered uh, a GMO. And in Canada, they look at very much around novelty. So if there's been a novel change, then most definitely they consider that something that needs to be looked at and regulated. But if it's not novel, then it may, and it doesn't pass the novelty test, then it's not, not considered a GMO uh, or a gene edited product and, and may not require regulation. So uh, it's different. And this is one of the big challenges that we have uh, globally for the introduction of any biotech product, whether it be plant or animal, is that our regulatory systems are not harmonized. We look at them quite differently. And maybe these are some questions that we want, might want to hear from our regulators on, on how we might be able to tackle that challenge. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Carl. Now we move forward to uh, questioning uh, individually our panelists. One of the questions that came up here is for uh, Dr. Portoneto from Danilda Hufana Duran of the Philippines. Uh, is there a possibility of off-target effects and, and mosaicism in genome editing, uh, genome edited 
uh, animals? What causes these possible incidences? And what are the corresponding safety issues, perhaps? Yeah. Safety issues to think about for the animals or for the consumers? Mm -hmm. And yes. for the animals, it, 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 it is a trick question because you, you can have a mosaic animal walking around yeah. it's like living a normal life there is a, it's like a it, it's a it's a normal animal and uh, the likelihood of having a problem in the in the food safety for human consumption i think mm -hmm. is so 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 remote and then uh i could i could ask or say people that works in the area much more much longer than me like in mark you stretch your net your your itching of it yeah. you can come please Jump in. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, yeah. So, I, I, sorry, just uh, I, invited there by Chuka. Um, I would say yes. It is. It's really uh, what we have to consider in all of this is the that 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 issue of regulation is driven by a desire to maintain the integrity, but the safety of food products going to consumers, and uh, you know that that's the driving force behind them, and and. It's perhaps a really great point of this this particular forum is for countries across Asia who are in the early days of forming their policies and and establishing those processes to learn from what's been happening in in countries that have been considering it perhaps for longer and where those things are more advanced, but where they're not harmonised as um, as Carl mentioned because. It, it's an opportunity to learn and and to get things right from the outset as to what is it that's going to define the safety of the product going to market and, and it, exactly as Juka said an animal that comes through this and that is walking around flapping around or swimming around is by definition alive and and generally well you know in all of these cases um, producers want animals that are well otherwise they don't produce well and that that in itself is a bit of a test of the safety um, uh, of the product but uh, we still need to consider you know how it's properly and formally assessed and that's the, the process well uh, if i can comment if i can comment yes. i think we have to come back to why we might ask the question on safety um and so the 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 frameworks for regulation around the world are centered around biosafety and so what is biosafety? Well, biosafety is the safety associated with uh, a biological hazard that may have some form of, or, or have some sort of opportunity to cause harm to people, animals or the environment. That's basically what biosafety is about. And we've got a lot of biological agents around that cause harm to people in the environment. So it might be a snake that can cause harm. It might be a mosquito that passes disease. It might be a virus that causes a pandemic or it might be a genetically modified or gene edited product that we have some uncertainty as to what sort of harm it might cause to us as people, to animals that are fed on it, or to the environment through in, you know, allowing it to, to be in, 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 the, in the wild. The reality when it comes to animals and animal production is they're very controlled processes and industries. So it's actually really easy to identify what the harm might be to manage that harm to either the environment or to people and i think eric talked about it in in his talk with the aquaculture in terms of how do you produce sustainably uh aquaculture products uh you know and a lot of that is done through uh fisheries that are quite tightly contained so the risks to the environment are low and if the products don't cause a toxin in terms of its feed then it's not going to be a harm to us but i think the regulators will might have a different view I would add one other point with regard to mosaicism. Okay. It poses right. no particular harm to the carrier or to the consumer. What it does is it complicates our breeding of the animal to get the trade into a, into a true breeding line in order to continue our selective breeding experiments. So that's mm -hmm. why we mention it. It's a headache for us as developers, not to the consumer. And then one last Sometimes point. It, yeah. Carry on. So it's just because it, it, it adds one more one more generation. But if you have a mosaic mm -hmm. animal, you have yeah. to screen the offspring again to find your the one carrier that you want. Yeah. So just go. So that final point that, that I wanted to jump in was was around the, the part of the question that was aimed at um, uh, off-target effects. 
because that yeah. comes up constantly with these new technologies. And, you know, uh, th there's an obsession to some extent around off target effects, missing the point that off target effects happen constantly during breeding. It's, you know, part of the process of breeding is bringing together variations of traits. And, mm -hmm. and that's based on the background of variants that exist for all genes based on a rate of mutation that creates that variation. That's the point of sex. That's the point of evolution. And it happens all the time. And, and what we're doing is we're doing a particularly targeted change in which people aren't worried so much about the targeted change. We know why we're doing it. We can see it. It's the off-target effects that there's an obsession about what's the problem there. And again, if an animal comes through this alive, uh, which they always do, they're the only ones that we um, develop forward, then there's no deleterious effect on that organism. And then you have to expostulate, why would that organism then present a problem to somebody consuming it? And path to harm is something that obsesses me. Articulating what is a path to harm from the use of this technology? And, and that's, I guess, where some of the regulators are starting to go. Risk mitigation, uh, characterize the possible risk. And if it's very low, then um, there's no need to, uh, to impose heavy burdens on, on regulation and, and burdens of cost and time that will hold the technology up. Yeah. Okay, there's one question here for uh, all of you. Uh, maybe you can share one at a time. <laughs> Thank you very much for your in, uh, presentation. So one of the things that they know, uh, this is from an anonymous attendee, is that most of the presented uh, researchers were are still on the experimental and research part. How do you handle the biosafety concerns of this, especially if the potential for commercialization is coming, is becoming close to that commodity? Uh, so we can identify some of the products in the pipeline that would be in the market soon. And so how would you uh, go about the commercialization state, uh, process? And it would be interesting, especially in the Philippines, where the biosafety research for animal commodities is still limited. I think it's not only in the Philippines, but most in, in the Asian region. Anybody? I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Um, Look, commercialization, as I think I mentioned in my talk, is not a simple uh, exercise. And I think, you know, Juka talked about it as well. You know, you need to have a, a pathway to market and that pathway to market has a number of challenges. Some of that is around the regulatory frameworks of varying uh, economies. It might not just be where you're producing your product, but where you're selling it. Uh, and you need to consider that. Um, you also need to consider what the industry is going to do. So you need a, a technology and a product that fits within the current production systems. If it sits outside of that, then it does, and it do, doesn't dovetail into the value chain, then it might struggle to get to market. Then the other mm -hmm. component of that is um, public acceptance and stakeholder acceptance. That's going to allow you and give you permission to bring that product through. And I think Alison will talk a bit about that in her talk um, uh, wow. in, uh, tomorrow. Uh, if you don't have product call and you keep pushing your technology to the consumers, they will resist it. So this is why some of the traits that we heard about, some of the uh, amazing opportunities that are there um, uh, are being put forward because they do actually have a clear demonstrable benefit to industry uh, and also benefits for consumers. And, and that's, I think, really, really important that we see those things um, uh, keep coming along. Yeah. Uh, Eric? In my, uh, own sector, in my own sector, we talk more and more about product traceability. And the motive for this at least in the fisheries field. It's because people want to buy fisheries products from fisheries that I know are well-managed and sustainable. And there's a similar sort of a motivation for aquaculture products. So the notion of having product identity from the farm to the consumer is not out of the picture in my sector. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming, I believe, more so in others as well, though I invite my colleagues to speak up to that. And so if the consumer wants to know about this, those sorts of systems can be applied. And I think that they are being more and more applied. And when I go to the store, I don't just buy salmon, I buy Chilean Atlantic mm. salmon, or I buy Alaskan wild caught Chinook salmon or whatever it is, that traceability is obvious. I pay a little more for it, I think, but it's trivial compared to the base cost of the product. That might be a model for some of this. 
Yeah, that's really important. The, the grain sector and the, the plant plant biotechnology sector has done this a lot. And the industry's actually got together and developed an, an excellence through stewardship program that really focused on product identity from research and development through to commercialization, through to that product being withdrawn because it's reached the end of its cycle. So that excellence through stewardship process has also been developed to incorporate, for example, gene, genome editing technologies. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that the livestock sector and the animal sector can learn a lot from that uh, quality management approach to the stewardship that you're talking about, Eric. And then ultimately the consumers can decide based on some information around where that products come from, the sustainability, and some trust in who it is that's been producing that product. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's correct. Is Tim Doran still here? Okay. Um, uh, uh, we can entertain one more question because, uh, well, we lost some time there. What, uh, how is this, again, from the anonymous attendee, this is for Eric, how is the infection of Rio virus manifested in grass carps? What is the standard of interventions that already is being done to prevent the infection? Do you think early detection of the Rio virus would be beneficial? Okay, so I sort of showed some of that one. I showed the subcutaneous hemorrhaging. And that's when a fish is sick, but it's not dying yet. Later on, you'll start seeing your fish behaving badly and dying. At that mm -hmm. point, there's not much you can do because we have no treatments for viruses, um, especially not in fish in ponds. And so your only alternative is to destroy your livestock. And once you have that on your farm, you're in a world of hurt. The approach to this is to buy um, stock, seed stock that's certified to be free of this virus um, and to do selective breeding or genome editing to try and develop virus resistant stocks. I'm looking ahead on some of the other questions that were also in the chat. We have many diseases in aquaculture that are similar. All of our viral diseases are a disaster when they hit your farm. Some of the bacterial ones we can treat to some degree. But disease is a real problem in aquaculture because you're applying drugs to the water. Yeah, yes. And there are real reasons to be concerned about that. Hence our interest in developing resistant broodstock. Okay, so I'm now, uh, thank you so much, Eric. We have, we can now accommodate one last question. Uh, I think this is for uh, Juka. Uh, when the gene from other species has been transferred to the surrogate mother, does the gene can inherit some characteristics from its surrogate mother? Is that possible? <laughs> Just like in humans. <laughs> no, the, 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 what they transfer in the male side is, the, is in the paternal line that they are transferred. So is the, is the spermatogonial. So it will be the, yeah, so it will be the, the genetically, the, the father will be a different one. This. Yeah, it comes with the behavior. There will be some of the behavior that is learned with the environment or with the growing animal, but some that is genetically encoded as well. So there will be a little bit of mix there. Okay, uh, can we have your last words before we move for a break? Uh, can you can start with uh, Carl on on your last or your important key message related to your talk. I don't have any key messages really, Ola, other than that. Um, many. <laughs> you know, there, are, there are many, but I think, you know, this, the, the, the purpose of this workshop is to see some of the opportunities that are coming. Uh, and in the next session, we're going to learn about, you know, how we're applying some a lens to ensure that those products meet the social acceptance in terms of their safety. Um, and I think that'll be really important for people to, to think about some of the opportunities and then now see what's actually in place to ensure that the food that comes out the other end is safe. Yeah, right. Uh, Eric, that's correct. Okay, um, in my sector, um, genome modification offers some really attractive options for breeding. Um, and my sector may lead, again, in terms of bringing a product to market before others. What I would add to that is that risk management has to be part of how we approach the marketing of these products. Just the way Aqua Bounty did with its genetically modified salmon, they would do with their genome edited 
tilapia. Yeah, and Juca? Uh, one of the highlights that I like was the how to, to generate impact in the whole industry using from, from the gene editing in the livestock. And because uh, this is a, is a long path, so we have to translate this into a herd improvement, which is, is easier said than done and, uh, and goes through many, many steps. The regulation is just one of them. So I think it will be interesting to hear the next, the next session there that we start the the discussion on the regulation process there. Okay, uh, since uh, we're really out of time, I think we will pass the bio break and proceed to the next session. And now I'd like to pass over the moderatorship to Mark Tizard, who is with us now. Uh, he, Mark Tizard, please introduce yourself and then we can proceed for session three. Is that Hi, uh, thank you very much, Ola. And uh, yeah, that was a, a great session. I think um, we're likely to have some more really good questions cropping up during uh, this particular session. Um, so yeah, we're now going to hear um, a little bit more about leading into the this space around um, regulation as as it's happening, and um, and also you know looking at the developments coming forward. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, somebody I know really well, who's been involved on uh, many, many conferences in and around this topic. So uh, Diane Barry Kane is uh, a senior advisor for um, health and production uh, and animal products for the US Department of Agriculture, and uh, has been on a long-term detail for the Foreign Agriculture Service of uh, USDA. And she's serving as a senior scientist and advisor for animal biotechnologies and has done so for more than 10 years now. And I think it's one thing that I'm, I'm seeing and, and enjoying because I've been in this field for a long time. And many people who have been here for a, quite a while and it's important. We need that corporate knowledge um, and, and the push, the drive, the continuity through that's going to help us. Um, so, uh, yep, uh, Diane has um, organized many conferences in this field and is going to tell us a little bit more about um, some of this background. So over to you, Diane. Thank you so much. Let me get my screen up. Okay, and um, is my, can everyone see my screen, Mark? Yep, perfect. Great. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for the kind introduction and hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you today about the role of regulatory approaches for encouraging innovation in animal agriculture. And I only wish that we could all be together in person. Today, farmers around the world face unprecedented challenges and we need to be better prepared to combat climate change and emerging emerging disease threats while increasing agricultural production and reducing both our footprint on the land and the resources needed to produce more food. We need to commit to transforming agriculture and making it more resilient. And as noted by the previous speakers, access to biotechnology tools such as genome editing could enable animal scientists to solve agricultural challenges and to address the threats both more quickly and also more sustainably. As described in earlier talks, there is a diversity of traits that have been introduced via biotechnology. And there's a potential for many more, many traits being developed focused on disease or pest control, potentially reducing the need for antibiotics or insecticides, as um, was mentioned recently in the responses that Eric had. Um, other traits target reducing the environmental footprint of animal agriculture and mitigating the impacts of climate change while creating more resilient animals. Others improve animal welfare, and there are also the potential to create healthier and safer food products and to improve animal production and efficiency, which can also help make animal agriculture more sustainable. The promises and opportunities are many, but whether they are realized depends on the regulatory processes in place. The regulatory approach that a country chooses is really analogous to a toolbox, determining what tools are available 
to their animal breeders and farmers. And we want to make sure that the best selection of tools in the, are in the animal breeding toolbox, both old and new, to address the challenges that we face. Regulations serve multiple roles. First, and of course, most importantly, is to protect the health and safety of humans, animals, and the environment. They also help to instill public trust in our food supply. In addition, effective regulatory approaches also encourage innovation. Regulations and regulatory approaches should be science-based and risk proportionate. They should also be defensible and credible to the public who, as we know, may have non-scientific or values-based concerns. If regulatory processes are to encourage innovation, they must be both timely and predictable. In addition, they should be appropriate for their intended use. Transparency is needed both to encourage innovation and also to instill public trust. For regulations to be truly effective, they must not only protect humans, animals, and the environment, but also allow for safe products to be used by farmers and the public. This is easier when regulatory approaches are harmonized amongst trading partners. Codex guidelines have proven useful for standardizing food safety assessments and therefore facilitating trade in foods derived from biotechnology. To help facilitate harmonized regulatory approaches for biotech animal products, Codex guidelines for food safety assessments of foods derived from recombinant DNA animals were developed in 2008, with the key elements for assessment being the nature of the RDNA construct and its expression, the health status of the RDNA animal, and the composition of food products produced. Since that time, a number of countries have developed regulations for transgenic animals containing RDNA constructs. There is no one best approach, and different countries have developed different effective regulatory approaches. In fact, it's really not possible for all countries to have identical regulation because different countries have differences in their existing regulatory structures and differences in their laws and legal enabling authorities, as well as different philosophies. They may also have different regulatory treasure triggers. For instance, either product-based like Canada with their novel foods approach, or process space as with GMO laws. Countries may have oversight by different regulatory authorities or ministries, and some have shared oversight by multiple ministries or even multiple countries, such as with Australia and New Zealand for food safety. That said, and giving credit to Codex, although there are differences in regulatory frameworks within different countries, there has been general agreement as to what is needed for evaluations and therefore um, similar requirements for RDNA or GMO products. As Carl mentioned earlier, there are some transgenic animals on the market, including many biomedical models and the glowfish, which now make up about 15% of the US pet fish market. In addition to the aqua advantage salmon that Carl and Eric discussed, which has been approved for food in the United States, Canada, and Brazil. Brazil has also approved a transgenic mosquito for disease vector control. And the US has approved the food use of meat from a pig developed for the use of biomedical products. As Carl noted, getting safe products of biotechnologies to farmers and the public has been a challenge. Regulations in many countries focus on the processes used to create a product rather than the safety or risk of the product itself. And there has been a political involvement in the regulatory discussions and decisions globally. Plus, we also need to recognize that there are additional challenges associated with public acceptance for animal biotechnologies. Many people have emotional connection to animals and are generally less familiar with animal agriculture. Animal biotech can also face disinformation campaigns from two fronts, those opposed to animal agriculture, as well as those 
who are against agricultural use of biotechnology in general. Tune in to Allison uh, Van Eneman's talk tomorrow on science communication for more about addressing some of these challenges. Now, as we step forward, we are now looking at changing scientific and global regulatory landscape for animal biotechnologies. And this has brought growing hope for the future of animal agriculture and the use of animal biotechnologies. Two developments have really altered the scientific landscape. First is the mapping of livestock genomes to identify DNA sequences associated with value traits. And second is the development of genome editing techniques as described earlier. Combining these two advances would allow for the rapid introduction of new traits while preserving diversity within livestock breeds that can be lost with conventional breeding methods. Now, many traits being introduced via genome editing could be introduced via conventional breeding. So why use genome editing instead? The reasons are many and they include being able to introduce traits not available from conventional breeding and to overcome low heritability while avoiding introducing undesirable traits, some of which may be co-inherited with those who are being selected. Genome editing allows breeders to target only genes of interest, therefore helping to preserve genetic diversity. This is also done with increased precision and efficiency. In addition, one important advantage is how it can also reduce the time necessary to introduce new traits to improve a breed. This is especially important in animals with longer generation times. For example, these lovely cattle at the bottom of the slide are my cousin's Brangus. This is a breed that was developed at a USDA research station beginning after the turn of the last century. The goal was to create cattle with the meat characteristics of an Angus and the heat and humidity tolerance of a Brahmin, that is high quality beef cattle that could thrive in hot human states like Florida and the US, where my cousin farm is. It worked, but it took many decades. The environment of our farms is changing rapidly and we need to have solutions quicker than conventional breeding methods can provide. Now with the advent of genome editing, many countries are modernizing their regulatory approaches with regulatory protection goals, of course, remaining the same as for all foods, whether they're biotech or conventionally derived. With the top priority being to protect the safety of humans, animals, and the environment. However, new regulatory approaches are focusing more on the characteristics and potential risk of the products of new technologies rather than on the method used to create them. This is done with the understanding of the importance of encouraging innovation and of allowing safe products to get to farmers in order to address the challenges and threats they face. Now, the question that regulatory officials around the world have been asking is when to regulate a product under their GMO laws. Now, there's general agreement that natural mutations and mutagenesis shown at green in the top of the slide are not regulated as GMOs, but rather as conventional products. There is also agreement that products where transgenes are inserted, shown at the bottom in red, that these are regulated under GMO laws with additional evaluations beyond those required for conventional organisms. The focus of the debate is on these categories in the middle shown in yellow. The question has been where to draw the regulatory line. And for many countries, that line has been drawn where this shown here in the uh, green dash line, where below the line are template repairs coding for foreign DNA sequences. And these are regulated under the GMO laws. And above the line, or are organisms that could have been created via conventional breeding, and these would be regulated as conventional products. 
Now, many countries are beginning to put in place new regulatory approaches for products of genome editing. And this map is intended to represent the current situation around the world, with the green representing countries with exclusions for some products, the yellow, those with pending policies, and the orange countries with GMO policies without exclusions. In 2015, Argentina became the first country to publish their regulatory approach for genome editing, excluding applications that did not incorporate foreign DNA sequences. Other countries in Latin America have followed Argentina's lead with similar exclusions. Israel put in place similar exemptions for plants, and Canada has a novel foods approach where products do not require additional regulation unless they are novel. In the United States, USDA APHIS published a new biotech rule for plants last year, exempting certain genome edited products. But the approach for food animals here is still under review. And Australia is currently also reviewing, um, is in the process of reviewing their biotech technology codes. And in the meantime, they have exempted some deletions. Norway has proposed a tiered approach while courts in Europe and New Zealand have made rulings saying that as their current GMO regulations are written, genome edited products cannot be exempted from their GMO regulations. Last year, both Japan and Nigeria finalized their rule, which are generally in alignment with those in Latin America. Other countries are also developing draft policies proposing potential exclusions. Now, many countries with GMO laws have been adopting approaches similar to those of Argentina. Argentina's approach for genome edited animals can be described by this simple decision tree, where products of genome editing that have a new combination of genetic material, sometimes referred to as foreign DNA, are regulated under their existing GMO regulations. Otherwise, they are excluded and do not require additional regulations beyond those required for conventional animals. In 2018, Argentina became the first country to make a determination for a genome edited animal, concluding that, certain genome edited, that a certain genome edited animal was not a GMO, but rather a conventional animal, and therefore did not require additional regulatory assessments. Brazil was soon to follow suit. Now it's important to understand that regulations and how they are applied or implemented can actually shape what products are developed and who can afford to use these new technologies. For most regulatory regimes, there are essentially two potential scenarios. To regulate the products or applications under GMO regulations with no exclusions, or if they do not contain foreign DNA or transgenic DNA sequences, to provide exemptions to regulate them under regulations for conventional products. If all products of new technology, such as genome editing, are regulated as GMOs, then we would expect a situation just like what we have for genetically engineered products, where large multi multinational companies are developing high return traits for a few row crops and none for animal agriculture. However, if products that could be created via conventional breeding are regulated like products of conventional breeding, then we would predict that more products would be developed by public institutions and smaller companies, and that these would include livestock, fruits, vegetables, and more consumer-oriented traits. Now, I originally created this slide a number of years ago using what I believe to be valid assumptions, but without data. And now there is data to support these expected outcomes. In 2020, Argentina published a, social, a socioeconomic study on the impact of their new regulatory approach for products of new breeding technologies or NBTs, such as genome editing. The results were dramatic. Under their GMO approach, 90% of their approvals were for products developed 
by large multinational corporations with very few from public institutions or small companies. However, they saw the reverse situation under their new NBT regulatory process where products of genome editing that did not introduce new foreign DNA sequences were considered non-GMO. For this approach, only 9% of the applications were from large companies and the majority were from public research institutions and local Argentine companies. Argentina also saw a dramatic shift in the type of organisms moving through their system with more than 25% of the applications being from livestock or fish. And they're also seeing an increase in the diversity of traits. For products going through their GMO approval process, over 90% of their approvals were for just two traits, herbicide tolerance and insect resistance in a few high value row crops. However, under their new policies for NBT, they observe that the applications are now much more diverse relative to the traits being created, including traits focused on animal welfare, consumer pre preference, and health benefits. Today, we find ourselves at a crossroads relative to the regulation of animal applications of animal biotechnology. As we, sit store, as we step forward, I have great hope for the future and that safe biotech solutions developed at our public research institutions can be used by our farmers and consumers and that the regulatory processes will be efficient so that genome editing solutions develop will be available in time to address the problems for which they were created. And I hope that countries will move forward together on regulatory policies so that farmers across the globe will have access to these solutions. In conclusion, ideally regulatory approaches should enable safe products to reach the market. They should also encourage innovation and very importantly, provide farmers with the choice of the best selection of tools available to better meet the challenges for the future more sustainably. We need to step forward and look to the future so that the next generation, like my cousin's children here, will have more options, not fewer, when it comes to animal agriculture. Thank you, and I look forward to um, addressing any questions in the panel to follow. Diane, that's fantastic. I I'm so used to you being an organizer and a chair and not seeing you present, and that, that was really thought-provoking and a great framework for us to approach the second part of the, the workshop, the remains of today and, and tomorrow, when we're going to hear more about some of the, 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 the policy and the regulation uh, sitting around this. Uh, I'll just quickly um, shout out to people, if you have questions, remember in the middle of your screen at the bottom, there's a and a section, please put them in there. Some things are coming up in, in the chat line, but uh, easy to manage the questions there. And I'm sure there'll be questions for Diane. Thank you so much. Um, it's now a, a move to hear from the two um, different speakers to round off the day. Um, one from a country that I call home that uh, has had policy and regulation in place um, for the last 20 years and uh, in a response to um, GM crops and, uh, and plant biotechnology that's been developed. Um, and then we're going to hear from um, a, a compatriot of our, our other organiser, Ola, um, from the Philippines, where um, policies and, and regulation are now being developed specifically for this, this area. So uh, the first speaker is uh, Dr. Peter Tiggerson, um, who's a principal regulatory scientist in the evaluation branch of the Office of the Gene Technology Regulator. That's an agency under the Department of Health um, for the federal government of Australia. Uh, I've known Peter for many years also, um, so disclaimer there. Uh, and. Um, uh, we've listened to each other. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion backwards and forwards. I have to say the regulators here in Australia are very good in terms of open communication, uh, discussion and, and giving good feedback. Um, so without further ado, um, Peter, over to you. Okay, I'm unmuted, I think. Um, 
and the laser pointer is working. Yep, so presentation's up, perfect. I'll, I'll dive straight in. Um, I'm going to cover some ground which is very similar to that that Diane covered. Uh, you might say this is a different view of a different facet of the diamond or of whatever the object is we're looking at. I'll start up right up front. My key message that I would like people to take away from this is to be very clear about the difference between legal and scientific definitions. Um, I'm going to give you some background about genome editing and regulation and a bit of discussion about definitions and principles. I'm also going to give uh, a viewpoint or a, a view on the global state of play and its implications. And we're going to talk about Australia's uh, experience with genome editing uh, and in relation to genome edited or genetically modified animals, I can say that there have been no GM animals approved in Australia for field trial or commercial production. Um, so that a number of the things I'll say here are kind of my analysis. So that's not legal advice. Uh, so next slide. I won't dwell very much on this slide but I always like to have some view of the history. So this whole story, and in relation to one of the questions in the chat just now, uh, perhaps an underpinning reason of why we've got all of this regulation in place, started with a meeting of scientists in Asilomar in 1975, and we're now nearly half a century later um, with a lot of things in place. <clears throat> got this 20 year lag from GM crops in the ground, and commercial GM salmon. Um, and at around about the year 2000, international an international agreement that's already been referred to, the Cartagena Protocol uh, and individual country laws started to come into place. Probably from my legal definition message perspective, the other thing that has happened is that there have been legal rulings about uh, what is the subject of regulation or not. And the most recent and the most famous was the European Court of Justice ruling in 2018 uh, and a range of responses to these things. Okay, so the kind of context, this has been covered uh, in different ways by the previous speakers, but we had a new technology. Uh, the precautionary principle was kicking around by 2000 um, and for the, potential developers, if you don't know about the precautionary principle, you might go and have a read about that and how it plays out in the international diplomacy uh, world uh, and with a view to have pre-market assessments. And as already been noted, exclude traditional breeding and mutagenesis. Um, really, really just need to skip over this. We've got process trigger or a product trigger or adapting existing laws with nothing really GMO specific and the USA is the classic example of that. Uh, I would say that most of the countries in the world have a, a process trigger based on a, some definition of what is genetic modification. Uh, Diane touched on this, a slide from the previous talk that I took out. Um, this kind of matches, and it sounds like from the talks today, matches the development work in the animal space. Genome editing is being picked up all over the world. So this, this related to a plant, a plant situation uh, where I was talking about, so this is GMO production, but that maps pretty closely to where genome editing is being pursued, at least in the R&D phase. So the Cartagena protocol has been invoked um, and basically all of those countries in yellow so that's the majority of the world's jurisdictions, I think you could say are parties to the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, uh, which you could say relates to GMOs, they call them living modified organisms. And then countries like Australia, Argentina and Canada uh, and Russia are parties to the parent convention on biological diversity. I'll come back to that later. Uh, and the US and a couple of others are not uh, parties to the convention and therefore not to the protocol. So this is kind of the quick summary up front of some more slides. So you've got an international regulatory landscape. We have different countries. They've got different laws and legal systems. It's already been noted that we've got different definitions around the world. And those countries have different approaches. They have different policies and they have different publics. And that you would 
expect to lead to different regulatory outcomes. So leaves the question of what's regulated and how, and I guess where. Um, so even with those different definitions, uh, in the year 2000, um, your classic transgenic, well, this is a plant one, with a 35S promoter, um, they will all capture the same thing as a GMO. We had some debate in the middle uh, 2000s about whether cisgenesis and intragenesis were covered. Uh, we'll leave that aside. And now we have this exquisitely uh, precise technology to be able to change uh, individual nucleotides potentially. So are they GMOs under current um, regulations for genome editing? Um, so I've already touched on that. In 2000, everything was captured, even if the definitions were different. But uh, now, if we have a different definition, we have the potential for different regulatory outcomes, which we might call an asymmetry. So the same organism that might be uh, legally a GMO in country A uh, is not a GMO in country B. So that leaves us with uncertainty, uh, both in relation to the trade for those and also in relation to some definitions about whether particular things are captured or not. I'll just jump forward. I was nearly going to take this slide out, uh, but in light of the discussion, I think the, the middle point, this middle channel here, I think is one of the messages I want people to take away from here. This is potentially going to depend on your country and how its uh, governance works. But in the Australian situation and for, for countries that have uh, a governmental system that looks something like the Westminster system, I think this applies to the EU as well, the governments make laws, they define what's going to be regulated and they give those to the regulators to administer the laws. So there's been several uh, uh, speakers mentioned that we'll ask the regulators. Um, well, in terms of making the laws, we don't make them. Uh, we just administer what we're given. And ultimately courts uh, in that type of jurisdiction will adjudicate the laws. They will ultimately decide what is and what is not regulated. This is not special to GMOs or gene technology. This happens for all sorts of things which are subject to legal regulation. I will jump forward to the next slide, which also illustrates those things. And if you're making laws or amending laws, a whole range of things which have all been referred to already today go into the making of the legislation. Um, so what's the science? What are the risks? What are the societal protection goals? What, what is it that view is important? What are the societal values which plug into that? But elaborating on this theme, once the laws are made, uh, it's all about the legislation. And so you have to have a fair and equitable application of those laws and you have to be consistent for compliance. And you can't interpret laws along the lines of, this is what it meant to say, the terms of scientific art have changed since then, the law is set as it was made and equally you can't say this is what it should have said. So take home message from there is in your jurisdiction or a jurisdiction where you think you will be a trading partner, you need to understand uh, what their law is at that particular point in time. Just run over this very quickly. So uh, Mark's mentioned the Australian regulation for GMOs. Uh, this talk is mostly about GMOs. I know that my colleague Lisa Kelly is talking about food tomorrow. These definitions were set very broadly um, in line with that precautionary approach, I think you could say. So any an organism modified by gene technology, very broad capture, some things are excluded. And gene technology is also defined very broadly. Uh, process trigger and the regulations that sit under the Act uh, have some inclusions and exclusions. And we'll get to that in terms of genome editing in a little while. Um, Diane showed a map of the world and where uh, regulations were moving. Um, I'm showing another one. And the point I want to make here is once again on this theme of legal definitions versus scientific terms of art or of, um, oh, fabulous. Um, hopefully that's gonna save my computer. Um, this is for plants, but to illustrate the point that it's, if you're talking about the law, it's important to go to the law. So this publication suggested that 
uh, genome edited crops are not regulated as GMOs, as a flat statement. However, a truer statement is that some genome edited crops or some genome edited organisms would not be regulated in Australia, but some are. So you have to take care at looking at uh, someone else's uh, analysis of a legal system, particularly if they're not lawyers. The Cartagena Protocol and Codex definition has been invoked. I won't go through this. Really, the point of popping this slide up is just to illustrate that this definition exists. Um, I think there's going to be some debate. That's my personal view in the future of what the definition means. Uh, but you have got recombinant DNA uh, in that arm of what is modern biotechnology. Uh, I've touched on this, so we've had European Court of Justice decision, the New Zealand High Court decision went a little bit unnoticed, but with a very similar outcome. Um, and I think Diane has covered eloquently uh, the approaches being taken by other countries. And I'll just note, um, I'm not going to go into this anymore, but synthetic biology is a hot topic of discussion in the Convention on Biological Diversity. And there are ongoing debates about that. And in the discourse about that, all sorts of things are being sucked into the, the vortex of what is synthetic biology. Um, from an Australian regulatory perspective, we would not say that genome editing is synthetic biology in the terms that anyone's discussing here today, but uh, it is being sucked into those discussions. Uh, CRISPR gets mentioned, uh, and so it gets lumped into the discussion. So something to be aware of uh, that may have some uh, interplay with the Cartagena Protocol. Watch this space. Okay, this slide looks similar to the one that Diane showed you. So this is the exclusion uh, in relation to genome editing in Australia currently. Uh, so if you have a change made by site direct nuclease where no template uh, instructions for repair are given, the actual Technology is classified as gene technology, but those organisms are excluded as not GMOs. And SDN2 and ODM, um, they would be captured as GMOs in the Australian context. Also note that there's a policy review which has been underway for some time. And the point to note is that that work is ongoing uh, a con what's called a consultation regulatory impact statement was published late last year um, with some indications of options for changing definitions. And I won't go into that at all, except to say uh, that what's proposed in there is at a much higher level than for argument's sake, the exclusion of SDN2. Uh, the, what's written from our big P policy colleagues is uh, not down at that level of detail. Uh, at the point at this point, but you'd have to watch what comes out from there. All right, very, very quickly about our approach to assessment. Um, we've got a risk analysis framework and we focus on harm and plausible pathways to harm and distinguishing events from harm. And we want information that's we need to know to inform a risk decision, not nice to know. That environmental assessment uh, considers the biology of the parent, the trait, the receiving environment, and that's drawn from OECD. I'll skip over that one. The considerations I would say are gonna be similar at the high level to plants. Is the phenotype of the GMO going to make it worse than any of, the, uh, any of its parent organism uh, progenitors? Mark's asking me to wind up, I think. I think I'm close. Uh, I would note here the salmon example that if you look at the history of that, that this could the GMO spread in space and time and can it be controlled uh, was a really, really big part of that discussion. Okay, last slide. Um, I'll perhaps just jump to be very careful to distinguish between legal and scientific definitions and the regulatory landscape is evolving. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much, Peter. That, that's uh, excellent. And a really good framing there of some of the issues. Um, and particularly, I think, you know, worth pointing out the, the line that um, 
uh, that Diane drew in that sort of uh, spectrum of what gene technology is doing or what uh, mutations through to uh, full recombinant transgenes. A line drawn around scientific lines is one thing, but in Australia, that line was really hit by issues of the law um, surrounding it. So regulations were amended within that frame. Um, really great too, in terms of like, you know, explaining the processes and the, the thoughts that go into this uh, approach to regulation. So now um, for our last session, um, uh, I will hand over to one of Ola's colleagues, um, Dr. Claro Mingala. Um, he is the chief of the Livestock Biotechnology Center uh, the Philippine Cabarro, Cab Carabao Center, um, as well as the chair of the drafting committee for the regulation of animal biotechnology in the Philippines. He survived, supervises the day-to-day -day operations of the center, um, uh, is someone who helps promote biotechnology as an alternative tool to help increase livestock production and um, bring the country towards food security. So um, this is a really nice contrast in, in terms of, you know, a, a, an organization that is now looking to, to bring in these technolo uh, technology regulations, specifically around um, livestock. So over to you, Clara. Thank you very much. Uh, do you see my screen now? Yep, just need to pop into presentation mode and we can hear you fine. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, good day to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm going to present to you the uh, policies of biotech, uh, genetical, uh, genetic engineered or gene edited animals in the Philippines. Actually, the Philippines has already a mother policy guidelines that uh, we call it the Philippine Biosafety Guidelines, which was developed around uh, uh, two decades ago but this is uh, uh, guidelines is more uh, leaning uh, to crops biotechnology and now that we are into the uh, animal biotech uh, or uh, genetic uh, genetic engineered or gene edited animals uh, issues uh, the department of agriculture organized uh, technical working group to uh, develop a joint department circular for GM animals and animal products rules and regulations. So uh, this is uh, a draft and uh, we are hoping that this particular JDC or a joint department circular would be uh, uh, approved within the year or at least uh, early next year. Uh, this subject is the rules and regulations for the research and development handling and use, transboundary movement, release into the environment and management of genetically modified animals and animal products derived in, uh, from the use of modern biotechnology. So this is composed of the usual articles, uh, the general provisions, the biosafety decision, the administrative framework, policy guidelines on biosafety assessment based on classification of regulated articles, the regulations of regulated articles and the miscellaneous provisions of this particular uh, JDC. So the applicability of this uh, JDC shall apply to the research development, handling and use of transboundary movement, release into the environment and management of genetically modified animals and animal products. Uh, th this products is uh, gene editing that do not contain novel combinations of the genetic materials are not covered, are not covered to be circular. So we are very uh, we, we, are, we are saying that uh, if there is uh, uh, a noble combination, uh, uh, this particular JDC covers this particular product. So we define the new noble combination of genetic materials as stable insertion in a genome of one or more genes or DNA sequences that encodes proteins that could not occur through conventional breeding or are not found in nature, or are the results of spontaneous or induced mutagenesis. So we all, the group also defined <clears throat> a GMO as a, uh, a product or animal that has uh, inserted a, a, a specific, part, a specific uh, sequence that are not usually uh, within it or within the animal itself. 
So the by in 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 bi safety decisions, uh, guidance in making bi safety decisions, we have the standard precautions, risk assessment, environmental and uh, risk uh, health risk assessment, socio economic, ethical and cultural considerations, access to information, transparency and public participation. So this particular section. Also, uh, we adapted also this particular section to the uh, crops uh, uh, by safety guidelines. So in the administrative framework, uh, role of national government agencies, uh, for example, uh, the first column here, the Department of Agriculture, it has uh, various uh, agencies that can cover animal and animal products. For example, the Bureau of Animal Industry or the BAI, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources, the National Meat Inspection Commission, the Fertilizers and Pesticide Administration, and the National Dairy Authority. And then we have the DOH uh, or the Department of Health. We have the Food and Drug Administration, the Department of uh, Environment and Natural Resources or the EMB or the Environment Management Bureau and the BMB. Then the DOST or the Department of Science and Technology Biosafety Committee, and then the DILG or the Department of Interior and Local Government. So this particular joint uh, department circular is composed of five uh, departments in the government. So in, uh, we have uh, what we call the Biosafety Core Team or the BCT. The DOST, DA, DNR, and DOH shall constitute their respective Biosafety Core team or an equivalent body composed of personal base within the agency. So each department will have uh, what we call the biosafety core team, wherein at least two members of the relevant BCT shall be designated as representative member of the job. So this is a very specific uh, for the Philippines because uh, this is the, the very first uh, uh, policy document that we will have for animals, especially for uh, genetically modified animals. And then we have the joint assessment group. Uh, all, of the, all of the departments should, will have a joint assessment group responsible for the actual conduct of safety evaluation. So the, the joint assessment group shall facilitate the drafting and finalization of its recommendation documents for submission to the Bureau of Animal Industry and the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Director. So we have a very distinct bureaus for the terrestrial, terrestrial and aquatic animals and will approve or deny the issuance of the biosafety permit for those developers. Then the Bureau of Animal Industry, Biotechnology Office and DFAR Biotechnology Office will do the administrative framework for this particular process. So the point line services will provide a technical and administrative assistance to the joint assessment group. So we have the administrative framework, the institutional biosafety committee, the scientific and technical review uh, panel, and then external technical expert. There are two, uh, three distinct uh, groups that will uh, facilitate the evaluation of uh, any application for uh, for the permit. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned, the biosafety committee, then we have the technical, the scientific and technical review panel, which is composed of various experts. And then we also have the external technical experts that's coming outside uh, the department. So we have the policy guidelines on biosafety assessment based on classification of regulated articles. So uh, this is the uh, example of the flow uh, for the regulated articles. So there, uh, we, we, we divided it into two distinct group, which, which is the research and development and the, for the commercial use. So for the research and, uh, research and development, we also uh, divided that for contained use or for limited release into the environment. And then we have uh, the same uh, in terms of the commercial use. We have already an existing uh, biosafety guidelines for contained use of genetically modified organism, which was developed at, uh, almost two decades ago. This is the RND for a regulated article under contained use. So for the limited release into the environment, which is still under RND, 
uh, DOST or the Department of Science and Technology by Safety Committee is co in coordination with the other concerned regulatory agencies, such as, as I mentioned earlier, will do the uh, facilitation. With regards to formulation and issuance of joint guidelines based on particular commercial use of a regulated article, uh, the concerned government regulatory agencies shall jointly formulate and issue corresponding guidelines on the decision-making procedure for the safety evaluation of a regulated article based on their existing uh, guidelines for conventional uh, products or livestock or animal products. So uh, they will be just be uh, using the formulated uh, guidelines based on this uh, JDC. Then the purpose specific guidelines for commercial use of a regulated article shall determine among others, of course, the definition of terms, uh, permitted commercial uses of application or application, specific functions of government regulatory agencies involved and the procedures for the application and issuance of BICEP permit. So uh, we tried to sort out the animals and animal products based on their uh, commercial use or uh, uh, objectives for use. We have the food, feed, and processing, uh, which is animals except aquatic. Then we have also have the food or processing for the aquatic species with their corresponding agencies uh, responsible for the regulations of these particular products. We also include in the JDC the xenotransplantation for, uh, uh, products. We have the uh, bioreactor medicinal and pharmaceutical, and then bioreactor for industrial purposes. We, we also include pets, terrestrial pets, and ornamental aquatic species, and others that can be identified later on. Uh, similar to the concerned regulatory agencies on the commercial use of a regulated article to general release into the environment, uh, we also sorted according to the purposes. So food, feed, and processing, food or processing for aquatic species, biocontrol, biocontrol for human health, household and industrial uses, animal disease control, and others. It's just that uh, we, we have uh, an issue with regards to the GM mosquitoes that we are now uh, uh, analyzing which agency shall, shall uh, regulate this particular uh, GM product because the GM uh, the mosquitoes are used to regulated by uh, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources but there is also point there that since this particular GM mosquito shall be used for the control of dengue or any viral diseases for public health uh, there is an issue also that the Department of Health should handle the regulations of this particular GM mosquito. So for now, uh, the different departments are now into the table to discuss and finalize which department should handle the GM mosquitoes. So the policy on the commercial use of a regulated article, we have this the process flow, filing, evaluating, and granting of buy safety permits based on the uh, uh, concerned departments that uh, will regulate the particular product. For the, uh, the regulation of regulated articles, uh, there are three proposals here. The validity, the validity of the biosafety permit shall be the same with the existing permits provided by the agency or to anchor the biosafety permit for GM animals and animal products so that uh, to that of the GM plants and plant uh, products regulations. And a firm, a firm scientific justification as to deciding the validity of biosafety permit for GM animals and animal products. So for the funding for this particular uh, uh, endeavor, uh, the Department of Agriculture shall allocate funds for the creation of the Biotech, uh, Bureau of Animal Industry or BFAR Biotechnology Office uh, for this particular purpose. So for now, we are looking forward that uh, the, this particular JDC will be approved within the year or early next year. And we are asking the help of the DOST Biosafety Committee 
to help us also facilitate for the public hearing uh, of this particular uh, document so that it will be approved by the different secretaries of the different departments uh, soon. I think this is my last slide. Uh, thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much indeed, Claro. Um, really great to see the progress that's being made in uh, uh, in the Philippines, and, and obviously hats off to you because you've been playing a leading role in that. So thank you very much for taking the time to participate in this. So um, we're now um, into the final Q and A session for uh, today's part of the workshop. Um, I'd remind you all that tomorrow is going to be some really interesting talks. We'll hear from Japan and from India. Um, and, uh, and I'm really looking forward to the final presentation we have from Alison Vaninanam, who's been asking some interesting and curly questions in our um, panelist chat area, um, which we may get to. Uh, first question I'll throw open is uh, one that's uh, to uh, Diane. Uh, regulation should be science-based was a, a, a statement that that you made, Diane. And um, uh, uh, Mozamem Hossein has asked the question, in most developing countries, the regulatory approaches are being handled by non-scientific personnel, especially bureaucrats. Um, what can we do um, in relation to this? Yeah, and, and you know, certainly that's you know obviously a challenge, and you know it's it's a challenge with the writing of laws everywhere. I think is as um, Peter alluded to is that the laws are written by legislators who tend, in most countries at least, not to be scientists, um, but the regulations and how they are implemented um, are done more by the the regulators writing them themselves, and so you know. One thing for developing countries is to partner with other countries, be they, and there are developing countries who have put in place effective regulatory approaches that allow for these products to reach commercializations. And, and so to, to partner with them, um, those that have similar laws to be able to um, move forward and help in the development of their own. Yeah, I, I, I wonder, I mean, like it, it, just the, the period of time I've been involved, it appears that uh, countries in which more scientists are involved in that um, discussion around setting policy, you get more progressive and perhaps um, more informed policy settings happening. I wonder if Peter um, would be happy to make any comment from his point of view. You just recap what you want me to comment on, Mark, sorry. Oh, yes, yeah. so that just around the <laughs> yeah. issue of, um, I and mean, I think it was really sort of perhaps a riposte to Diane. About saying, science you know, based regulation? Yeah, because um, we, we certainly have a situation in Australia where the, the, the and I, I see it in experience, that even with some of the work that we do, you need contract lawyers to write contracts because they write in a language that is different to our scientific language, hence, it's lawyers that are writing the laws, but then ultimately, um, as Diane pointed out, it's, it's scientists like yourself who actually are involved in the regulatory process to be able to understand. So I, I think sort of maybe I'll make a distinction between, um, uh, and I, I won't speak for, for Lisa from the food side, but uh, <laughs> we have an influence at the regulations level, but in terms of them being drafted, but they're still... Uh, basically not completely in our control to write, but we're, I think perhaps uh, there's a distinction here between the US system in terms of the top level law and the lack of prescription in that, in the Australian situation where the top level law, those definitions are quite prescriptive. Um, and I think it, it's a challenge in all sorts of areas, as you both alluded to, of legislators or the officials who are in charge of developing policy, doing the consultation to be across the issues. This, this is a, a personal observation. I think there is a, a high degree of precaution about, about these things. And you can look at what happens with some of the policy debates and the, the debates which are going on with respect to COVID at the moment. Uh, the things which are in the public discourse are not always science-based and I think that's almost unavoidable and 
someone may talk about this tomorrow, but, but another aspect to probably avoid in the discussion with stakeholders is falling into the deficit model. So scientists tend to think, well, if you just give them enough information, they'll understand and it will be okay. But the, the social reactions to these new technologies, which may be inflamed by other interlocutors, um, don't actually often relate to the science per se, they relate to their value systems. So it's kind of in the communication that you wanna have, whether you're a developer that wants to communicate with your government, your ministers, who are gonna write the laws or in the public in terms of taking stuff forward, I guess the key thing is to remember that, understand what the audience is that you're seeking to influence. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll probably leave it leave it there. Yeah, no, that's yeah, great. Science communication um, is definitely key. I mean, yeah, it's just, it, it's something that we need to continue to work on and improve. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, all of us that are involved in the field would, would agree with that. Uh, I wonder if um, Claro wants to also make a comment in that space, because it seemed that um, there, there is a, a, a good introduction of um, uh, of scientific input into the process going on in the Philippines. Yeah, of course, uh, we also have uh, this kind of problem or issues in the Philippines, but we, we make sure that we always have a lawyer with, uh, within us when we do the drafting of the policies. And we are also very thankful, of course, uh, with, with the, the ISA, especially when they uh, organize a kind of the seminar for the legislators. So we make sure that uh, those legislators would also understand uh, the, what we are coming from, especially science-based approaches. Thank you. Yeah, that's great, Claro. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll throw back to a, a question. Uh, I'm still waiting to see any more questions popping up in the Q and A. Um, but uh, there was a question that was posed by someone who's going to become a presenter and panelist tomorrow um, in a um, communication of uh, panelists, and that is it was thrown to to Diane, and and it may be something that we all want to ask, which is around um, the clearly the the definition of genome editing changes uh, the way we look at um, what might be per perceived as risk, but then it's thrown light onto that recombinant DNA is apparently seen as a uniquely hazardous. And, and, and a lot of what we see is, is about exclusions or around redefining what is something that's gonna go into regulation or not. So would you like to make a comment on you know, that, that issue around the perceived versus real risk of recombinant DNA in these, in these food systems, I guess is the, the bottom line. Diane. Yeah, because it's, it's not, you know, what I was reading wasn't so much the perceived risk, but rather the agreement with regards to what falls underneath the GMO laws versus what falls outside of the GMO laws, which is, which is a different conversation than what is risky and what is not risky. And, you know, as I think it's Peter was saying, you know, going back to a Silomar, you know, was where we began talking about, you know, the potential risk and the unknown. And I, you know, I think, you know, the hope was is one learn more than perhaps things might be less regulated, but um, lawyers don't necessarily work that way and laws don't necessarily work that way. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's not really what's risky or not, but what falls within that legal definition and what doesn't. Yep. I don't know if Peter I, wants to add to that. Yeah, I, I, th I think, we, I think we're a little bit uh, captive of history um, yeah. that mm -hmm. because, because those laws were made at that point in time uh, and they're quite precautionary and, you know, borrowing from a Silomar, this DNA is the stuff of life and it's somehow mysterious and um, magical. Um, but now that the laws are in place, quite hard, uh, I think, to, to see how they could be, like if you were starting with a blank piece of paper, now it might look quite different. I guess that's really the point I wanted to make to make there. Um, we'll just see, see how it goes. Maybe it will go incrementally 
uh, as we go along. Um, maybe some indication of that is going to come out of the CBD meeting whenever that's going to be held uh, yep. in terms of uh, where country governments are talking about things. Like completely, I, I know that sustainability was mentioned uh, in the first uh, part of the webinar today, and I wonder whether there might be some intersection of the uh, sustainability development goals and these technologies as they've been discussed in terms of how they how they might contribute to those from our regulatory perspective in Australia that that's not going to change how I do anything uh, in in my office but in that bigger policy debate maybe they will have um, some place in the discussion yep. yeah and I think no, one of the very... challenges sorry I think one of the challenges there is also with the public perception yes and it's sometimes difficult for laws to move when before public perception moves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's again a, a onus on those of us in the field to you know up the ante with the the clarity of communication um, and getting that getting out there and getting the message out. I also, just thought I'd like swing back onto something that Peter mentioned in his presentation, which is, and I've said you know it's a little bit of a thing that I'm passionate about. It's path to harm. You know, the issue here is uh, perceived path to harm because you put that word recombinant DNA, uh, novel combination, and that immediately, well, then there's a path to harm. But you, you still need to look at and examine, well, what is, the, the, what's the mechanism, what are the steps in the path to harm? What are we, what's the risk we're trying to mitigate by this? And notwithstanding that ultimately we've got to be, be able to tell the public this is safe and this is why we know it's safe. So... Um, uh, I wonder if Clara wants to make any final comments on that and we'll, we'll need to wrap up and take our questions to tomorrow after this, so. Yeah, uh, I think it's still fallen under the good science communication. You know, it's, it's not uh, no difference with the one that we have now with regards to the COVID vaccines. <laughs> you know, everybody is, you know, almost half or all, uh, half of uh, the population is uh, very much afraid of taking the the vaccine because they don't know exactly what what's in it or it would give them harm it's also similar to what we have uh, in these uh, uh, issues uh, particularly the GEA and the genetically modified uh, uh, animal so it's just that we not, we need to base uh, scientifically our explanation and how we will convey the message to them clearly uh, not very high, highly technical, but uh, what they can perceive. Uh, yes, it is not uh, traditional, unconventional, but uh, we need this because we want uh, to have uh, food sustainability in our tables. Thank you. That's great. Um, so look, uh, it's a really good note to, to finish on the importance of, of good communication. And I would just say thank you to um, to the speakers that I've uh, had to look after in the second session. Great communication there of, of all the issues. And I think the same goes for the, the beginning session that um, was uh, moderated by Ola. Um, fantastic communication throughout. And I think we will have a really great session again tomorrow. We'll meet at the same time tomorrow on the same link. And we will um, actually finish up with someone who is, is right up there in terms of... Um, uh, science communication so but there's some great ones in between so please tune in early tomorrow um ola i don't know if you wanted to say any more you seem to have your hands full there um a little beautiful image for us to take away <laughs> um, if there's no, nothing, nothing else, else I, yes i just want to say thank you for all the panelists that have joined us this today and your session we need you again so that we can have a final uh discussion during the the yep. morning session where we have india and japan joining you in the policies yep. thank you and Great. see you tomorrow